to take him down right away. I'm going to take him down and uh, push the action. I'm going to set a pace that's going to be hard to follow. He's not going to want to stand with me. I want to beat him up. I want to prove that, uh, that I can do that. Another fight, another win, and that's what I plan on doing here in April. I'm not the guy to tap last time. I'm not the guy to say uncle, you know? I'm not the guy to get beat down when I shouldn't have got beaten down. When you, when you say stuff like that, you know you have to pay for it. And uh, I'm going to make him pay uh, April 19. I know that this guy is going to have to want to come back and make an example of me, and I'm not going to be making an example of This This guy has no idea of, uh, of how strong I could be, how fast, how powerful I can be. Want to show me the real GSB? Show it to me, man. I'll be there. You know, we'll see what goes down. is contested in Canada. George Rush St. Pierre, born and raised right here in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. He was the fighter he thought would just run right through the welterweight division. He had beaten Frank Trigg, Sean Shirk, BJ Penn, even the legendary Matt Hughes to win the welterweight title. It was just supposed to be another day in the octagon for George St. Pierre, when at UFC 69, he met Matt Serra. Three minutes and 25 seconds later, Sarah had shocked the world, and now tonight, they meet again. My partner Joe Rogan, Family Obligations. Joe, I know you're watching, so I'm joined by Kenny, Ken Flo, Florian, and Kenny. They do indeed love GSP here in Montreal. There's no doubt about it. I mean, uh, the crowd went nuts at the weigh-ins. Uh, Matt Sarah couldn't even get any word in when he was getting interviewed yep. at the weigh-ins. So I definitely have no love for Matt Sarah here in Montreal. Well, when you speak of Matt Sarah, perhaps he was the only man who thought that he had a chance to win the first time they met, and he truly believes that he will once again shock the world tonight. No doubt about it. Um, if he wants to shock the world again, he's going to have to do what he did last time, and that's pressure GSP from the beginning. You have to back up George St. Pierre, come at him with pressure, come at him with punches, get on the inside of his reach, and take him out. It has been well documented that after the fight, George St. Pierre talked about not being 100% prepared mentally and Sarah did not take that very well he thought it was a show of disrespect I will tell you tonight there is still a little lack of uh, lack of kindness if you will but also GSP is ready mentally and physically tonight he guarantees he'll be the best he's ever been I've never seen George St. Pierre so emotional at the weigh-ins yeah. he's fighting in his hometown will that affect him can he overcome and erase the memory of that loss against Matt Sarah well Coming back against Josh Koscheck and against Matt Hughes, he ran through both of those guys. He out-wrestled four-time All-American Josh Koscheck, went right through, did everything to Matt Hughes, took him down. 
submitted him, ground and pound, everything. So he believes this is the best George St. Pierre that we will see tonight. He also believes he'll get the real belt back in the welterweight division. But what do you think? You can let your voice be heard on who you believe will win our welterweight title fight between Matt Serra and George St. Pierre. You can vote online at UFC.com or on your cell phone by texting A for Sarah, B for George St. Pierre to 88222. We'll keep you updated throughout tonight's pay-per-view. Our text voting brought to you by Tap Out. Also on the card tonight, perhaps the second and third best, arguably, at 185. Now, yes, it's been a while since Travis Luter has been in the octagon, but he was pretty good, even though he lost to Anderson Silva. And Rich Franklin spent a lot of months, formerly, as the UFC middleweight champion. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, Travis Luter probably did the best job uh, that anyone has done uh, against Anderson Silva. Uh, you got Rich Franklin, who's coming off a loss as well. I mean, he went in there, did his best, but Styles make fights. He believes that this is a striker versus grappler matchup. He needs to keep it on his feet. He believes he's the better wrestler. He believes he's the bigger fighter. He wants to keep this on the feet and take him out. And Travis Luter believes that if he beats Rich Franklin tonight, he'd like to have another chance against Anderson Silva, and he believes he'll beat both of them. He has gone on record saying that Anderson Silva will never beat him again. Travis Luter is one of the best American Brazilian Jiu Jitsu guys out there today. He wants to, he's ain't no secret about taking this fight to the ground and finishing Rich Franklin. And we should note that Travis Luter made weight easily in anticipation of this middleweight matchup at 185 pounds against the former champion, Rich Ace Franklin. Speaking of 185, the ultimate fighter winner, the count tonight, makes his middleweight debut. Michael Bisping is an Ultimate Fighter 3 winner. He's very well rounded and has one of the most dynamic striking games in the UFC today. And he will be taking on Chainsaw Charles McCarthy. Charles McCarthy fights out of American Top Team, has good wrestling skills and excellent submissions. Our rules of the octagon. As always, three judges will score the bout. The bout duration, three five minute rounds. Tonight's championship fight is scheduled for five five minute rounds. As always, a 10 point plus scoring system is in effect with the round winner gaining 10 points, his opponent nine or less, based on effective striking, grappling, aggression, and octagon control. The UFC, the best thing to happen to Canada since the invention of the hockey puck. Great fans here in Montreal, out throughout this fine nation, and we are pleased and honored to bring the Octagon here tonight to Montreal. Tonight's UFC available in high definition. Sold out over 21,000 in attendance, and we begin in the lightweight division. Toronto-born Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt, the man named Mark Bocek faces the dominating Ultimate Fighter winner, Mac Danson. After a competition that saw him survive six weeks in a house with 15 other fighters, Mac Danzig emerged victorious from the Ultimate Fighter Team Hughes Team Sarah in December. Tonight, Toronto, Ontario native Mark Bocek aims to give Danzig a little dose of reality, UFC style. First UFC in Canada, five hours away from my house. I got a lot of family, friends, students here. No way I'm letting them down. I plan on looking to pick my shots, pick them apart, and, and punish him every time he tries to step in. Now a member of the renowned Team Quest, Bocek is rounding out a world-class ground game with the wrestling and striking the California standouts are known for. Fresh off his first UFC win over Doug Evans last December, Bocek is returning to his homeland with no intention of giving up that winning streak. Tonight's gonna be the night because He's got to prove that he's legit, and in order to do that, he's got to go through me. The early favorite to win the Ultimate Fighter, Team Hughes versus Team Sarah, due to his experience and world-class talent, Danzig lived up to all expectations during the show, and he finished emphatically with a first-round submission of Tommy Spear. Tonight, the seven-year mixed martial arts veteran begins his post-reality show career in a tough matchup against Mark Bocek. Train my ass off for this, and, and I'm ready. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to do it. I'm ready to show the fans what I'm all about. I'm ready to make a statement at 155 and be a part of the elite in this weight class. Born in Toronto, fighting out of Woodbridge, Ontario, Canada. 
Mark Bocek, a double black belt. He has a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, a black belt in Kempo Karate. He has trained in the past with Greg Jackson. He's now training with Dan Henderson, Team West. I mean, this young man, 5-1 in his mixed martial arts career, has a ton of talent. Uh, you know, he has very underrated wrestling. His wrestling is phenomenal. And he's quite possibly the best submission expert in Canada. He believes that uh, he matches up very well against Mac Danzig. I, I believe the same thing. I mean, you look at the way he, he needs, to beat Bo, uh, needs to beat Danzig. He needs to take him down, control him, keep the fight at his pace. Trained for a year with the Gracies in California. 15 years of studying karate. Began as a youngster. You mentioned Canada and black belts. He was one of the first in Canada to earn his Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. And neither man, Bocek or Danzig, has ever been submitted. At one time, Mark Bocek was training the ownership of the UFC in Jiu-Jitsu, and now he wants to own the UFC. And most pertinently, he wants to win tonight in his home country. Mark Bocek, 5-1 overall in his mixed martial arts career. I exit out of my again. Full horsemen of the apocalypse for my Born in Cleveland, Ohio, raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Grew up with a single mother. He said that not being so fortunate helped him build the character in which he utilizes today inside the octagon. And to say that Mac Danzig cruised through the Ultimate Fighter competition on season six, I think would be fairly accurate. He went through everybody, and at that experience, that environment is very difficult for any fighter to deal with. Uh, Mac Danzig uh, performed superbly uh, against very tough fighters uh, in that season. Here he is, he wants to prove himself against Bocek, and uh, he believes he's a more well-rounded fighter, and he wants to take him out with a knockout. Training full-time in Las Vegas now. This is his first fight since defeating Tommy Spear to become the ultimate fighter, Team Hughes versus Team Sarah. Uh, very well-rounded, has some jiu-jitsu, but it would be a stretch to say his jiu-jitsu is as good as Bocek's. Bocek definitely has the advantage, but I think it's gonna come down to his speed and his footwork. If he can use his speed, I believe he's faster than Bocek. He needs to use that footwork, circle off, not allow Bocek to get him up against the fence and take him down. A nature photographer, vegan, uh, very much uh, a, a nature boy, if you will, self-admitted Mac Danzig, but when he gets into this environment, he has no lack of enthusiasm, courage, or talent. As Bocek and Danzig open up the action here tonight inside the Bell Center. Art! Ladies and gentlemen, we are live from the Bell Center in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, for USC 83. And now, it's time to begin our first bout of the evening. Three rounds of fighting in the UFC lightweight division. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner. This man is a Brazilian jiu-jitsu fighter holding a professional record of five wins with one loss. He stands five feet eight inches tall, weighing in at 154 and one half pounds. Fighting out of Woodbridge, Ontario, Canada, Mark Bullchamp. And now introducing his opponent, fighting out of the red corner. A mixed martial artist holding a professional record of 18 wins with four losses and one draw. Standing five feet, eight inches tall, weighing in at 154 and one half pounds, fighting out of Los Angeles, California. He is the winner of season six of The Ultimate Fighter. Ladies and gentlemen, Mac Danzig! And when the action begins, our referee in charge of the octagon is Eve Loving. Eve Levine has the honor of officiating the first live match on our main card here tonight ever in Canada. Ariane, Edith are here. The octagon gates are opened. They are now closed, and it officially becomes ready, the first sir? main ready? event, fight. the first regular fight ever contested in Canada. Bocek the Canadian, and the American Danzig. Solid black trunks for Bocek. The black and gold trunks for Mac Danzig. Danzig needs to stay in the middle of the octagon, avoid the cage, needs to keep using his footwork, 
circle out of the way of his takedowns, and make him pay with his hands. Danzig, not, not really unlike yourself, Kenny, in the Ultimate Fighter, kind of went up a weight class. He is pretty much a natural lightweight. You went up a couple of weight classes, so he was very comfortable cutting to 55 and making his lightweight debut here tonight inside the UFC. Shows how experienced he is. He's got his hands, he's dropping his hands, kind of playing with Bocek a little bit. He's got to be careful with that. Looks like Bocek landed a hard shot. He kind of smiled at him. I think that hurt him. Can't underestimate Bocek striking here. Bocek looks nice and calm, comfortable, but he's going to use his striking to get in and try to take Danzig down. He doesn't want to stand up for too long. Now, Kenny, as Joe Rogan often says, when the guy who gets hit smiles, that usually means he got caught. Beautiful entry, nice, nice entry on that single leg by Bocek. He's got him up against the cage. Danzig's looking for possibly a Kimura counter. Danzig has good takedowns and is, Kenny mentioned, great jiu-jitsu. Nice countering by Danzig. Bocek working that single leg. He's got his head tight on the inside. He's got to run the pipe. Run that leg to the right. He's switching to a double leg or ankle pick. Danzig doing a nice job of making him pay. Nice sit by Bocek. Bocek's got him up in the air. He's going to finish this right here to a double. Beautiful, beautiful wrestling by Bocek. Very relentless in his takedowns. Mike Van Arsdale, a tremendous wrestler, UFC veteran, says he believes Bocek has the best takedowns in mixed martial arts today. Trying to tee off on Mac Danzig. Mark Bocek. Everyone thinks Bocek's just a jiu-jitsu guy. He is not. He's got some serious wrestling skills. Uh, he dominates people with his position more than his submission. He's good at riding that position, getting to a side mount, working his ground and pound. Danzig is locking up a triangle, switches to an open plata. What a transition by Danzig. Beautiful job. Can he finish it? Bocek needs to stand up, he's straight and he's out. Nice ground and pound by Bocek. Bocek teeing off on Mac Danzig. Danzig staying nice and calm. He wants to keep his back up against the fence so he can get back to his feet, just like he's doing right there. 18-4-1 overall, Mac Danzig. Definitely the experience advantage in this matchup, and his experience carried him through the Ultimate Fighter house. Absolutely. Definitely has a lot more fights than Bocek. Bocek, though, is over those UFC jitters. He's fought a couple times no now in the UFC. He looks comfortable. Danzig admitted that he did not love this fight style-wise, the matchup with Bocek, and Bocek trying to utilize his great jiu-jitsu skills here early. He knows that. Bocek knows that. Bocek took him down again. Doing a great job of keeping that pressure on Danzig. This is exactly what he needs to do to win this fight. 145 remains in round number one. This lightweight matchup scheduled for three five-minute rounds. Half guard now. Nice pressure by Bocek. He's kind of hanging out, getting the half guard, keeping that pressure. Nice, slow, methodical game. Danzig once enjoyed a 12-fight win streak. And in this world, that's a, an incredible feat in itself. No doubt about it. Danzig's trying to work a nice high guard, maybe trying to lock up an arm. He went for it. Bocek stood up, postured out. Danzig's going to get back to his feet here. He pushed off. Now he's up against the fence, Kenny. What he's doing, he's doing a good job of keeping his back to the fence. This is not allowing Bocek to kind of get that double leg again and keep him pinned. Danzig really using his experience here to get back to his feet. Nice job. Well, certainly he has been challenged before and pushed to the limit. He's been defeated four times, but inside the UFC or UFC competition, including the Ultimate Fighter, this is the most we've seen Mac Danzig challenge, and now he reverses and punishes. Danzig is waiting for that opportunity, waiting for that mistake. And now he wants to make Bocek pay for it. Half guard, now a Bocek. Trying to jump right into side control. Bocek's strength is when he's on top. That's where he likes using his jiu-jitsu. Believe he doesn't want to be off on his back here against Danzig. Danzig wants to keep it down and possibly steal this round. He could steal this round, Golden. Mac Danzig, although he doesn't technically have the black belt in jiu-jitsu, his jiu-jitsu level is in many's estimation at the black belt level, and we see some of it here. He is as well-rounded as they come. Good round one. Nice job. Nice round, but I think you're up on that. 
Ryan Parsons. Mark Bocek. I need your pressure. Three. Three breaths. More jab. More jabs to get inside. Certainly some good guys in his corner. He's been training with Henderson for the last three fights. Feels that his health, health his game is combining of his jiu-jitsu with his wrestling, with his striking. And he's putting it together nice in that first round. Great Maynard, Sean Tompkins in the corner of Mac Danza. Look great. Great control for him. Great Maynard coming off a very impressive victory. Good control for him. Good patience. Use your jab to make it move. Turn your cross over. You look great, Mac. You're doing a good job. Control the center, all right? On paper, one would consider Danzig the far superior striker. Let's see if he's able to utilize that so-called or potential advantage here at the beginning of round two. Danzig seemed a little amped up there in that first round. He needs to settle down, start finding his rhythm out there, start measuring a little bit better. He needs to measure that distance a little better. Botek's doing a great job of, of measuring that distance and getting in on his legs. Swing and a miss. Bocek's doing a good job of backing Danzig up. He's putting that pressure up. He wants to get him up against the fence. Danzig needs to stay his ground and circle more. Let's see who puts together the better combination. Oh, oh big knee! What a knee by Danzig! Wow, down goes Bocek hard! That Danzig trying to finish it! That landed square on the chin of Bocek. Danzig! Looks like Bocek's recovered, Kenny. Bocek has recovered. He looks like he's getting his wits back. Howard Danzig here. It looks like he's not going to be able to finish him. He's got to either get position, get a side mount, or bring it back to his feet. This is a tough position, yep. though. He's got the side mount. He's got the arm pinned. Oh, he's, he's out of it now. He's in half guard. Bocek's coming up for a single leg. Nice elbows by Danzig. Danzig making his official UFC lightweight debut. Those are some solid elbows by Danzig to the temple. What a knee. Beautiful timing by, by Danzig. Yeah, and that's just a credit to the great conditioning of Bocek that he was able to recover. Bocek is tenacious with those takedowns. He's staying right on Danzig's leg. Beautiful knee again. Knee. Off the single leg, his leg was up in the air. He's making this an exciting fight, Goldie. Danzig, as we mentioned, the far superior striker, creative as well this evening. Three minutes, five seconds remains in the second round. Danzig getting some heavy hips there. Working the sprawl beautifully, getting to a half guard. He's trying to work the mount position. Bocek's hurt there. He's got him up against Bocek the fence, is hurt. Too. He's in a bad spot, Kenny. Bocek is hurt there. Danzig was teeing off. Bocek kicks him off. Danzig comes right back on top of him. And passes right away. Oh, just so easily. Did he pass it out? Boom, right to the mount. Right into mount. Right into mount. With Bocek's jiu-jitsu skills, he wants to be on top, though. His strength is not the guard. Danzig is taking advantage of it, and he has his back now, and he wants to make him pay. Can he submit the Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt? He's got him stretched out here. This is not a good position. He's in a great position to choke him, Goldie. Let's see if he does. Bocek truly in survival mode here. This round has belonged to Mac Danzig. Bocek was really good in round number one. Danzig with the full mount and plenty of time to work. He still has a hook in there, but it's, that's just, just as good as a mount there. He's trying to work that other hook. Now he's got both hooks in. Wow, this is bad. Bocek has to be expending a lot of energy to get out of these positions. Danzig wants to take advantage of this and finish him with a choke or with a TKO here. Again, he tees off. 140 remains in the second round. Nice cross wrist by, Dan cross wrist by Danzig. Danzig's getting up and out. He's going to pull this back to his feet. Danzig has to feel confident here. Bocek is a bit gassed. Here in the corner, Mac Danzig saying, let your hands go now. Bocek's coming to kill here. Bocek with a good combination and goes for the single leg. I'm really impressed with the tenacity and cardio of Bocek. Bocek is still going forward after taking those shots. 
Some awesome wrestling, some great counters here by Danzig, by Bocek. Bocek right in here, shot of Dan Henderson and Ryan Parsons. Danzig doing exactly what he wanted to do. If he is getting in on his legs, he's making him pay for every shot. And that's what's gonna hurt Bocek. That's what's gonna tire him out and break his will. 35 seconds remains in the round. Again, Danzig in a dominant position. Danzig's now riding, just kind of trying to work position, but he's tired. He wants to kind of conserve his energy for that third round. Danzig. Ten seconds remains. Comes down with force. Let's see if he delivers one last good shot here in round number two. Danzig has to be careful there. We will head to the third round. Wow, all about the knees of Mac Danzig in round number two. Let's look at this replay here with this knee. Beautiful, beautiful right knee to the jaw of Mark Bocek. He lowered his head a little bit too much, got caught with the knee. Here it is off the single leg. His left leg is in the air. Some beautiful athleticism by Mac Danzig. Control the center, don't race around chasing him. All right, you look great. That was an excellent dominating 10 8 round. 10 8 round right there. Right now, okay? Change your double a lot sooner on that, okay? You need the posture, then change your double. It's not working for much of the body. He's tired too, okay? Hey, Brian, come on. Let's finish him. Let's go in the distance. Let's finish him. Neither fighter has ever been submitted. Third and final round, Danzig. Bocek, to make the argument, Bocek got round number one. Danzig very dominant in round number two. Sean Tompkins, his trainer, said it was a 10-8 round. They touch, and here we go. Dan Five minutes remains. Dan Henderson and Ryan Parsons gave, him, gave Bocek some great advice. He said, stop going for the single, go to the double earlier. That's where Dan he's been having more success against Danzig. Danzig's doing a great job of countering that single leg. Oh, he, he just caught him. Again. He just caught him. Caught him with the right. right hand. Danzig looks way more comfortable now. Starting, starting to settle down and back Bocek up. UFC 84, ill will. May 24th, MGM Grand Garden Arena. UFC lightweight title fight, BJ Penn, Sean Shirt. Tickets are sold out. 10 in the East, 7 in the West, available only on pay per view. Log on to 84.ufc.com. Bocek is showing some serious heart. And determination here. Keeps going for that single and double leg. He's finished it. Beautiful job. This round could determine the fight. Danzig on his back again, as we saw in round number one. Danzig working the Oma Plata, possibly a go go Plata, where he's putting his foot and shin across the front of the throat of Bocek, where he can actually get a choke from there. He can combo off the arm or the choke, throwing some nasty elbows at the top of Bocek's head. Danzig had the rubber guard for a second. His right eye is bloodied up. Now he tried to get up, but Bocek able to keep him down. Three and a half minutes remains in the fight. Bocek is grinding out this third round, doing a good job of controlling Danzig. Danzig staying calm, doing a good job getting his back to the fence so he can work back to oh, the fence. Oh, look at this. Instead of pushing your opponent into the fence, Bocek pulls him away from it, trying to prevent him from getting up, but Danzig able to do so nonetheless. Smart adjustment by Bocek. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to capitalize on that, but he realized Danzig's getting up to his feet with the fence. He's using the fence to get Another up. Another knee, Kenny. Now he's making a pay. Bocek uh, is hurt. That one opened him up. He's bleeding pretty Danzig bad now. Feels it. Danzig looking to finish. Coming forward, head kick. Bocek truly in survival mode here. He's Bloodied up by the knees of Mac Danzig. Bocek's breathing. Breathing pretty heavily now. Two minutes, 40 seconds remain to the fight. Danzig needs to do oh, a little bit more. He just top. hurt him. Caused Bocek to turn his back. Bocek still, though, yeah, trying to survive. He's Timeout by Eve Levine. The doctor will check the cut. Nasty knee coming forward up to the eyebrow. That's what caused that cut. 
Once again, it was the knee that hurt Bocek. Looks like they're going to let this continue. The cut is over the left eye of Mark Bocek. Oh, that is nasty. That's a nasty cut. That could potentially stop the fight. When it's over the eye like that, having the blood go into the eye could stop the fight. That's where it causes some danger to the fighter. It is OK. It's bleeding away from the eye. Bocek's ready to go. Danzig's ready to go. What a fight. Listen to the crowd here at the Bell Center. Bocek is game. Danzig. Nice right hand by Danzig. Again with a combination. Comes forward with the jab. Danzig really likes to use that lead hand hook to the body and to the head. He hasn't had a chance to really utilize it in this fight, but now he's landing that jab. Needs to put it together with some more combinations here. Bocek showing great heart and courage. Not okay. a surprise, though. We knew it was possessed by this young man. Bloodied up hey, big time by Mac Danzig. Danzig, Danzig to trying to tee away one more time. Straight right. Doing a great job of keeping the distance with his strikes. Not committing, but still making Bocek pay from that position. Sweeps the leg, takes him down. Nice trip. Switch from that plump position. He's got to be, Danzig has to be careful with his leg. He's in the mount position He's got now. the mount. This is bad for Bocek. Still 90 seconds remains. It's got to be difficult for Bocek right now. It's going to be difficult to see with the blood. He's tired. He's in a bad position. Danzig's got both hooks. He's working the choke. This could be the finish. Mac He's got it Danzig the neck. looking to finish the fight. It's a wrap. It is all over. Mac Danzig chokes out Mark Bocek. What a fight. Danzig finishes with the rear naked choke. Here it is, a bloody Bocek. He's on top with the hook, stretched him out, got that arm underneath the neck, was able to finish the rear naked choke. Unbelievable performance, what a war. Great job by both competitors. You know, Kenny, oftentimes you, you will see something on paper, third round submission, oh, he submitted him. What Danzig did was win this with knees. Beautiful job, uh, obviously did a great job scouting out his opponent and caught him several times. Now the first one was the cleanest. Then with one leg already wrapped up by his opponent, he lost another one. And boom, caught him again, opened up a nasty cut in the third round, and then was able to finish Mark Bocek. This was the first one, bam! Bocek just leaned into it, and that's the one I spoke of before where he's wrapped up. Good clinch, pull the head down, bring the knee up. Impact is very dominant, and Danzig wins in his lightweight debut here in the UFC. Bruce Buffer has the official decision. Ladies and gentlemen, referee Eve Leving has called a stop to this contest at three minutes, 48 seconds of the third round, declaring La Gagnon and winner by top out due to a rear naked choke, Mac Danzig. Mac Danzig earns the victory, and I mean earns the victory over a very game Mark Bocek. He's with Kenny Florian. Mac Danzig, what a war. Uh, he, you won the Ultimate Fighter at 170. How's it feel to make your debut at 155? Exhausting. Um, he's a really tough guy. I mean, I, I couldn't stop his shots in the beginning. He, he's really motivated to get a takedown. People don't know how tough this guy is. It's just a very, very serious fight for me. And people were just writing him off because he fought in two prelims. No one knew who he was. It's a tough fight for me, but my heart, I fight with my heart all the time. You did it in his home country of Canada. Unbelievable job. What were you thinking after that first round? He was able to control you, won the first round. What caused you to come back? Um, I, I can't lose. I, I can't let myself lose and go out like that. Um, I've lost fights before, a couple of decisions in my past career from uh, letting guys get the takedown and dictating the pace of the fight just by being on top like that. I said to myself, it doesn't matter how tired you are, you can't let that happen. And I didn't let it happen. Awesome performance. You're a warrior. Congratulations, Mac Danzig, everyone. Thanks. Mac thank Danzig. You know, I want to thank everybody that's involved with the UFC. From Dana on down to all the people that helped help me out with the PR and everything. All you guys behind the scenes, you're the ones who make it happen. And thank you for supporting me, Canada. 
I love fighting here. This is my fourth time I fought here. I love the Canadian fans. My girlfriend's a Canadian. Been with her for five years. Give me some, give me some love. Mac Dancing deserves some love tonight. He submits Mark Bocek for the first time in Bocek's career in front of the beautiful Mandy Moore and over 21,000 in attendance tonight. And don't forget, you can let your voice be heard throughout the evening on who you believe will win our welterweight title fight. You can vote online at UFC.com or on your cell phone by texting A if you believe Matt Serra will win, B if it's George St. Pierre, who is your pick to 88222. Our text voting brought to you by Tap Out. Tap Out, American, arrogant, and in your face. UFC 83, Sarah versus St. Pierre 2 is being brought to you by the only motorcycles worthy of being in the octagon, Harley Davidson, and by Edge Shape Gel. Get your edge. Coming up later tonight, it is our main event of the evening when we will find out who the undisputed UFC welterweight champion is, Matt Sarah or George Rush St. Pierre. Matt Sarah arrived earlier tonight here at the Bell Center. The Long Island native plans to come into Canada and shock the world again by defeating George Rush St. Pierre for a second time. George St. Pierre arrived at the Bell Center and he tells us he has never been more focused or well prepared for a fight. And tonight could truly be the most memorable night of George St. Pierre's career as he fights in his hometown. So tonight, the welterweight title is on the line, and next month, it'll be all about the lightweight title. The two best lightweights on the planet. The UFC title on the line. The war is on, and it's personal. Current champ BJ, the prodigy pen, collides with former champ Sean, the muscle shark shirt. Sean Shirk, you're dead! I don't have any respect for BJ. Oh, that belt still belongs to me. It's a grudge match for the history books to determine the world's greatest lightweight ever. Wow! Also, two light heavyweight super fights as the Dean of Mean, Keith Jardine, steps back into the octagon after his victory over Chuck Liddell to face the ferocious Vanderlei, the axe murderer Silva. And undefeated 12-0 Lyoto, the Dragon Machida, battles the Huntington Beach bad boy, Tito Ortiz. Oh! The Ultimate Fighting Championship and Bud Light present UFC 84, Ill Will. Live Saturday, May 24th from the MGM Grand Garden Arena in Las Vegas. Only on pay-per-view. Take a look in the locker room of Matt the Terracera, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt under Henzo Gracie. But as we found out the last time he fought George St. Pierre, also a very dangerous striker. And inside the locker room of George St. Pierre, the interim welterweight champion, there seems to be a calming influence as George St. Pierre truly believes that he has improved himself in and out of the octagon and will become tonight the undisputed UFC welterweight champion. And speaking of George St. Pierre, he graces the May cover of Fitness RX for Men. The article offers a peek inside George St. Pierre's world and inside his head as he talks about the secrets that allow him to stay focused and keep his eye on the prize. Fitness RX for Men, the May cover, features George St. Pierre. Pick it up at newsstands now. And don't forget, fans continue to vote at UFC.com or on your cell phone by texting A for Sarah, B for GSP to 88222. We'll keep you updated on your thoughts throughout the pay-per-view. Let's move ahead. This war has started way before tonight. Charles McCarthy says Bisbing is average. Bisbing says McCarthy is a fat BJJ guy. Tonight, only one will have the final word. Britain's Michael the Count Bisbing became a star in the UFC at light heavyweight. Tonight, he makes his debut in the middleweight division and promises to be even better at 185 pounds. Chainsaw Charles McCarthy plans to have something to say about that. He's got the name to go with it. He's got the marketing behind him. You know, he's the number one guy in England that the UFC is trying to break into their market. But he's the biggest name, worst fighter out there. If he is of the mindset that 
all these fighters are handpicked for me, then surely he's forgetting that maybe he's just the next one that's handpicked. That he's going to get destroyed, just like the rest of them, then. When McCarthy finished up his stint on the Ultimate Fighter 4 and took less than a round to submit Gideon Ray in the season finale, the Floridian seemed to be on his way to big things on his way back up the middleweight ladder. But injuries kept him on the sidelines for over a year. Tonight, he knows that one win over a rising star like Bisping will make up for lost time in a hurry. He hasn't had that point in his head where he's like, crap, my arm's breaking, I gotta quit. He hasn't had that feeling of having to wake up after getting hit. You know, this is something that I'm gonna change for him. A fighter who gave up size to almost all of his opponents at light heavyweight, Bisping still managed to put together a 15-1 record fighting at 205 pounds, with the only loss, a razor-thin decision to Rashad Evans. But it was after this defeat that Bisping decided that he needed to compete on a level playing field. Tonight, he begins his attack on the middleweight division with the same fire that has made him a UFC fan favorite. Fingers crossed after tonight, we can maybe put together a little highlight reel of uh, various different knockouts against Charles McCarthy. Well, in the Ultimate Fighter house, he was known as Captain Miserable, Charles McCarthy. Trying to smile here, Kenny, but I will tell you one thing, he's extremely confident as he enters the octagon tonight. Even though he hasn't fought in nearly 16 months, he had knee surgery to repair an ACL, LCL, and meniscus damage after his fight against Gideon Ray back in November of 06. But one thing that cannot be ignored is that he's out of American Top Team and he has tremendous jiu-jitsu. No doubt about it, he's got some slick submissions, good wrestling, he believes his striking has improved tremendously. Training American at American Top Team, obviously has some awesome training partners. Uh, they probably had the most intense stare down yesterday at the Wands that I've ever seen. <laughs> they, uh, they had some words, they've had words back and forth. Allegedly, McCarthy fired first. Bisping, not surprisingly, had plenty to say back. All 10 wins of his mixed martial arts career have come by submission for Charles McCarthy. And he relies heavily on his strength as he enters the octagon again. And that is, as previously mentioned, his ability to submit people. Chainsaw, Charles McCarthy entering the octagon to try to take out Michael Bisping and spoil Bisping, the count, UFC middleweight debut. Some people were doubting whether Bisping were able to make the weight comfortably. He really did. He looked phenomenal at the weigh-in, looked fresh, bouncing up and down. He looks ready to go. He believes this is the best Michael Bisping that we will see. Michael Bisping is 6'2". So now he all of a sudden goes from an average-sized, if not undersized, light heavyweight to a man who was a very large 85 and should a lot of times have a size and strength advantage. No doubt about it, he's a big 185-er. He's adding a lot of quality to this tough 185 division. McCarthy, I mentioned all 10 wins in his career by submission. 14 of the 16 fights that Bisping has had, victories indeed, have been by strikes. The fight against Matt Hamill was the first time Bisping went the distance. And now tonight, he wants to send a message not only to his new enemy, McCarthy, but to the entire UFC middleweight division. Our tale of the tape for this middleweight matchup is brought to you by the only motorcycles worthy of being in the octagon, Harley Davidson, the Briton, Michael Bisbee, 29 years old, two years the elder, 
of Charles McCarthy, and there you see a great example right here. At middleweight, with that 75 and a half inch reach, he will have a definitive reach advantage over McCarthy. Bruce Buffer with the introductions. Ladies and gentlemen, this fight is three rounds in the UFC middleweight division. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner. This man is a mixed martial artist, holding a professional record of 10 wins with four losses. Standing five feet, 11 inches tall, weighing in at 186 pounds. Fighting out of Coconut Creek, Florida, Chainsaw Charles McCarthy. And now introducing his opponent, fighting out of the red corner, a ballet judo fighter holding a professional record of 15 wins with one loss. He stands six feet two inches tall, weighing in at 185 and one half pounds. Fighting out of Manchester, England, he is the light heavyweight winner of Ultimate Fighter season three. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael the Cat. begins our referee in charge of the octagon is philip chartier bisbing looks great at 185 philip chartier our referee michael bisbing he is ripped and ready to go he says he's faster than ever before in order to stay at that weight you have to train harder to be harder on his diet he looks great our fight clock brought to you by avpr oh, ready. unrated ready? on dvd and right. blu-ray today here we go Red trunks for Bisping, white trunks for McCarthy. Let's see if McCarthy tries to get this fight down to the ground quickly. Bisping looks really fluid, very fast. Now he can't take you down, Bisping. That comes out of the corner of Michael Bisping. Charles is throwing some big overhand lefts and rights. He's got that open-handed defense. Bisping knows he needs to take this fight to the ground. Bisping's obviously very comfortable on the feet. He's going to avoid the takedowns by circling, using his jab. Good knees. Four. And a huge uppercut. Ah, McCarthy. Having a little fun inside the octagon. He's taking it to McCarthy. McCarthy's frustrated here, just throwing big bombs. McCarthy has tried that overhand right twice. The punch that Chuck Liddell made famous. <laughs> Chuck Liddell measures a little bit better than that, but uh, <laughs> Charles just has to use his takedowns to get him, has to use his strikes to take him down. He's not, he doesn't want to trade with uh, Bisping for too long. I'll tell you that right now. McCarthy with his antics inside the octagon towards Bisping. Does that bother Bisping at all, or can he ignore it? Uh, Bisping's a professional. He's been in there many times before. Having fought at 205, he's got to have a lot of confidence coming in here, fighting at 185. He looks so quick here, Kenny. You can see the comfort level. Bisping putting together combinations. McCarthy kind of just throwing some big bombs, just one punch at a time, one kick at a time. Bisping looks really smooth. McCarthy doing a good job defensively, though. Bisping again with a knee and then an uppercut. Bisping is picking him apart, going to the body, going upstairs, going to the clinch. His movement just seems so much more fluid. Absolutely, absolutely. He's moving his head, he's in and out, very light on his feet. Nice stuff from Bisping. Good support of the Brit here in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. More knees and an elbow, and a big takedown by Charles McCarthy. McCarthy could McCarthy have been making him feel comfortable to set up that takedown? Beautiful drive, he got in on his hips, and then drove to finish that double leg takedown. Nice job by McCarthy. He's got him up against the fence. Oh He's going to try to work ground go. and pound and set up a submission. Bisping in the half guard of Charles McCarthy. McCarthy wants to push down on that knee, try to get to mount, try to get to side mount. Doing a good job. He's kind of just playing a jiu-jitsu game. He's not really throwing too many punches. That's gonna make Bisping feel pretty comfortable here, and he's gonna get back to his feet. Bisping's gonna get back to his feet. He's gotta be careful not to get his back taken. McCarthy McCarthy's trying to go for an arm lock. He's working an arm lock. Plenty of time remains in the round. One minute, 50 seconds. Fight scheduled for three five-minute rounds. This is where McCarthy is the best. We said as he entered the octagon, Kenny, 
He relies very heavily on his strengths, and this is his strength, submitting his opponent. McCarthy has that leg over the face of Bisping. Bisping needs to be careful. He's got it pretty tight. He's got to keep that arm bent. He does not want that arm to straighten out. He's trying to shuck it off, kind of shake it through. Bisping staying nice and calm here. He knows what he needs okay. to do here. Allegedly, McCarthy said he was going to um, do a little damage to the arm of Michael Bisping, which fueled the fire and the emotions that yesterday's weigh-ins. Bisping's working that elbow joint out of the hips of and he's McCarthy, great. and he's out. Beautiful job. Beautiful Comes out job. quickly, too. So McCarthy with a big takedown, but he couldn't finish Bisping. Bisping continues. Good combinations by Michael Bisping. That's got to be frustrating for McCarthy. Did a great job getting him down. Couldn't finish that submission. Bisping's opening up on him now. Bisping's measuring him with that jab and setting up that backhand uppercut. Going to the body of McCarthy. Oh, just teeing away is Michael Bisping. McCarthy surviving so far. We saw McCarthy get dropped to the body with the Loazzo spinning back kick. Down he goes! Bisping, Bisping dropped him. Trying to finish the fight. 12 seconds left in the round. Will McCarthy make it? He's still moving around, still defending himself. And Charles McCarthy is going to survive. Nice heart by McCarthy there. Wow. How good does Michael Bisping look? It's over. It's all over. McCarthy is holding his arm. Looks like he's holding his forearm. One of those knees, Kenny, could have done a lot of damage. One of those many knees to the forearm of Charles McCarthy. It could be right. He was he was covering up. He had to defend those knees with his with his arms. Those knees may have done the damage. Here it is, right here. Absolutely. It was those knees right to the forearms. Better get hit in the forearm than the head. He tried his best. Couldn't defend properly. You know, you always talk about bad blood and gamesmanship. As you see the knees in the finish here by Michael Bisbing. Charles McCarthy just came over, congratulated Michael Bisbing, gave him the, the timeout, and said, congratulations, you are the better man today. And I'll tell you what, this Brit is really, really strong at 185 pounds. I have never seen Michael Bisbing look as good as he did tonight. Got to keep the sponsors happy. Thanks, Tap Out. Yeah, everybody wondering who might be <laughs> next for Anderson Silva. Like Rich Franklin, Thank Travis Luter want to be there, of course. But perhaps Michael Bisbing will have something to say about all of that. Bruce Buffer with the official decision. Ladies and gentlemen, after the first round, Charles McCarthy could not continue the fight. Therefore, referee Philip Chartier has called a stop to this contest, declaring La Gagnon and winner by TKO, Michael the Cab Another great show of class and respect. Yeah, and Bisbing knows he caught him in the forearm with one of those knees, and Michael Bisbing will visit with Kenny Florian. Oh, Michael Bisbing, phenomenal performance. Yeah, there was some bad blood going on between both of you guys. Uh, McCarthy said he was going to break your arm. He had your arm at one point. What were you thinking when he had that arm bar? Well, to be honest, um, I mean, I, I know the escape. I, ha I had the defense in, but I was still thinking I shouldn't be in this position. No, <laughs> this isn't exactly the game plan. But uh, fortunately, my training paid off. I managed to escape it. Full credit to Charles. There was a bit of back, you know, a bit of trash, whatever. It's the fight business. It happens, you know, I don't take it personally. I hope Charles as well, and we can share a drink later. My eyes, you look great at 185. How'd you feel for the training for this, the weight cut, coming in here and fighting in front of these amazing fans right here in Montreal? Um, I've been practicing. J'ai vu c'est Montréal. Merci beaucoup. Merci, merci. Um, 185, you know, I'm, I've always been a middleweight. Um, but I suppose my stubborn 
manliness, or whatever you want to call it, got in the way. I preferred fighting the bigger guys, but um, this is my natural weight class. I feel great. I didn't have to cut any weight. I didn't put sweatsuit on. I didn't get in a sauna. I didn't do none of that, you know? Um, so I'm excited to see what I can do at 185. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm establishing myself in the weight class. I've done that tonight, you know? So let's see what the, what the future brings. I want to fight the best guys out there. I want to prove myself, you know? I'm still maturing in the sport and, you know, I'm learning all the time. You know, I'll learn another lesson tonight. You know, I just want to say thanks, everybody. Thank all my sponsors, all my team, everyone who helped me train. Thank you, merci. I see a great future for you, man. Congratulations. Michael, the Count Bisbee, the first Brit to headline a UFC. That was UFC 78 yes. versus Rashad Thanks Evans, and he team, wins everyone. his everyone first California, middleweight in matchup. Justin Inside oh, the no, octagon no, goes no, to 16 no, and 1 overall no, in his no, mixed no, martial no, arts no, career. No, thousands and thousands have been heard already, but there's still plenty of time. So far, an overwhelming amount of our voters think George St. Pierre will become the undisputed welterweight champion. Don't forget you can vote online at UFC.com or text A for Sarah, B for GSP to 88222. Our text voting all night brought to you by Tap Out. Tap Out, American Arrogant and In Your Face. Watch Tap Out in their crazy second season starting this June. Speaking of starting, what a start to the night here in front of a record-setting crowd at the Bell Center in Montreal. Coming up later tonight from here at the Bell Center in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, former middleweight champion, Rich Ace Franklin, faces Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt, Travis Luter. So that fight is coming up later tonight here at the Bell Center. And here's what's coming up inside the Octagon. Every Wednesday this spring, it's the Ultimate Fighter, Team Rampage versus Team Forest. Then on Saturday, May 24th, from the MGM Grand Garden Arena in Las Vegas, Nevada, it's UFC 84, Ill Will. BJ, the prodigy pen, takes on Sean, the muscle shark shirt. Also that night, Tito Ortiz faces Leoto, the dragon Machida, and the axe murderer, Vanderlei Silva, returns to the octagon to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Keith Jardine. UFC 84, live Saturday, May 24th, only on pay-per-view. The UFC returns to the UK on Saturday, June 7th from the O2 Arena in London, England. UFC 85, live on pay-per-view. Tickets are still available. Then it's back to Las Vegas in the Mandalay Bay Event Center for UFC 86 as Quentin Rampage Jackson faces Forrest Griffin. Saturday, July 5th, tickets are still available. And that's what's coming up inside the Octagon. Coming up right now inside the Bell Center, Montreal, Quebec, Canada, another middleweight matchup as Ultimate Fighter veterans collide. And yes, I would believe the Canadian from Surrey, British Columbia, Caleb Starnes will be the fan favorite as he matches up with the survivor, Ultimate Fighter 1 vet, Nate Rock Quarry. After almost two years on the sidelines due to injury, former world title challenger Nate Quarry returned to the Octagon in style last September. He hopes to keep the momentum going tonight against British Columbia's favorite son, Caleb Starnes. It's a pleasure for me to be uh, here fighting in, in Quebec, and, and uh, I love the city of Montreal, and I'm going to put on the best show I can. Uh, well, I'm looking at this fight just to be another opportunity to show why I'm here in the UFC, why I was able to come back and compete against such a tough competitor as Pete Sill and still come out with a victory. The 33-year-old Starnes enters the octagon not only looking to erase the memory of a controversial loss to Alan Belcher last October, but to put on a show to remember for the Canadian fans who he hasn't fought in front of in over two years. I'm gonna win by knockout or decision. I think it's gonna be a big surprise to him that I can outbox him and I'm faster than him. Some thought Quarry would never fight again after back surgery following his 2005 loss to Rich Franklin. And after an exhaustive rehab, he came back last year and engaged in a war with Pete Sell before he put Drago away in the final round. Is he better than ever? Tonight's bout against Caleb Starnes may answer that question. I think with my last fight from Pete Sell, I had to shake off some of the ring rust. I was coming off of a very long layoff. I uh, had my back surgery. I was able to show that Nuvasa made my back strong, that I'm here to fight. Uh, I belong in the UFC. 
and now I've been able to focus more on just building on what you saw last time. Hold it now. Oh. Come on, come on. Nate Rock Warren. Benny, you remember very well Ultimate Fighter 1. He was in his weight class, pretty much the guy everybody thought was going to walk away with the crown, not Forrest Griffin or Stefan Bonner. And then one of his own coaches rolled on his ankle, and that was the end of that dream. You know, Corey has overcome a lot uh, from that ankle injury to the back injury. He's a tough, durable fighter. We saw that in this last fight against Pete Sell, and he wants to establish himself as a contender here in this division. He likes to utilize punches to the body, unorthodox with his stand-up. His last four wins have been by KO or TKO. You know, he basically is a guy who's not a wrestler but still possesses those skills, can submit. But what may be his best weapon is his pinpoint precision with his striking. He is, he throws, he throws punches from awkward angles, and if he lands that on your chin, people go down. And uh, Corey is, is more than happy to, to trade and brawl with you. But uh, he also has, he possesses good wrestling skills. He's been training on the ground for 12 years. So uh, he's really, he's seen it a lot, has seen it all in his career. And he's very well rounded and feels comfortable regardless of where this fight ends up. Well, a longtime member of Team Quest, which as we know, houses some of the finest fighters in mixed martial arts today. Now he fights out of what's called the Sports Lab in Gresham, Oregon. He is ready to leave the winner again tonight against Starnes. Born and raised in Surrey, British Columbia. Tonight, Starnes makes his first Canadian appearance since he defeated, ironically, Jason McDonald, who was also on the card here tonight, back in 2005 in beautiful Vancouver. Caleb Starnes has trained a lot in American Top Team in preparation, going back and forth from his home in Canada. He says, Kind of, and Kenny, you talked to me about it earlier, has a new comfort level with his entire mixed martial arts arsenal. Uh, definitely. He's matured as a fighter. Uh, you don't just step into the octagon and feel comfortable uh, you know, from day one. He's had his experience. He's had his ups and downs. He stepped up his game with his training with the American top team. And uh, he says he'll, it doesn't matter where this fight ends up. He feels comfortable as well. So uh, this is a potential for another bar burner here. Good exchanges in his last fight in Cincinnati. It turned out to be a loss to Alan Belcher because of that nasty cut that was suffered by Starnes. That ended up actually getting really infected. He had to take about three months off, but, but still, we saw the ever-improving striking skills of Starnes against a pretty darn good striker in Belcher that night in the Queen City. Even in his win against Chris Lehman, a very dangerous striker in his own right, he did a great job of standing there not getting hurt with many punches. He used a, a nice mixed bag of, of striking and wrestling and jiu-jitsu skills and pulled off a, a, you know, what a lot of people thought was an upset win over Chris Lieben. Starnes and Corey are set to collide. Our tale of the tape is brought to you by the only motorcycles worthy of being in the octagon, Harley Davidson. The Canadian Starnes from Surrey, British Columbia, three years younger than the Oregon boy, Nate Corey, he's 36 years old. Everything else is virtually identical. Starnes is taller, but he actually does not have the reach advantage. Once again, here's Bruce Buffer. Ladies and gentlemen, this fight is three rounds in the UFC middleweight division. Introducing first, Fighting out of the blue corner, a mixed martial artist holding a professional record of 15 wins with two losses. Standing six feet tall, weighing in at 185 and one half pounds. Fighting out of Gresham, Oregon, Nate Rock Quarry! And now introducing his opponent, fighting out of the red corner, a wrestler and jiu-jitsu fighter, holding a professional record of 10 wins with three losses and one draw. Standing six feet three inches tall, weighing in at 186 pounds, fighting out of Surrey, British Columbia, Canada, Caleb Starnes. And when the action begins, our referee in charge of this contest is Dan Mergliata. Dan Mergliata, our referee, middleweight matchup. 
in front of Ariani, Edith, and 21,000 plus, a new attendance record set tonight here in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Another shout out to our good right. friend Joe Rogan, Ready? family obligations. He's Let's not go, here fight. tonight. I'm Octagon Let's side go. with Kenny Florian, and here we go. Yeah. Corey in the black trunks, and Caleb Starnes in the white trunks. Corey putting pressure on from the very beginning. Trying to corner Caleb. Nice body shot by Corey. Two ultimate fighter veterans colliding here. Corey seems a lot looser than he has. He feels seems lighter on his feet. Usually pretty stiff, pretty unorthodox. That's the one criticism, if there has been one, that somewhat robotic, if you will. We spoke of the ultimate fighters inside the octagon. Now the ultimate fighter team, Rampage versus Team Forrest, continues. Wednesdays at 10 on Spike. Wednesdays and Fridays on Rogers Sportsnet here in Canada. Check your local listings. Corey is bringing this fight to Caleb. Caleb was uh, running away from him at one point and uh, turned into a running race at one point. And now Corey has his back to the cage here, trying to avoid the takedown of Caleb Starnes. Corey's throwing a lot of leg kicks. Doesn't usually throw as many leg kicks. Well, he's been working his stand-up with Olympic champion Howard Davis Jr. And yeah, he's added the, the kicks from the knees, and, or the knees, pardon me, and the kicks as well to his arsenal. He's Corey, as you said, Corey. very, very heavy-handed, but that's some head movement maybe we didn't see in the past. Definitely not when Rich Franklin tagged him. He's going to need that. A lot of times, Corey, you know, he's a warrior. He takes a lot of shots in his fights, now using head movement, you know, using the sweet science of boxing to hit and not be hit. Very nice head movement by Corey. We saw how long the legs of Starnes were a second ago. Inside leg kick on that left lead leg of Caleb Starnes from Nate Corey. This is, the, this is the best Nate Corey that I've seen as far as stand-up goes. He looks great. Caleb's kind of running away. Corey's really putting the pressure on. Starnes has never lost in his fights here in his home country. He has one draw in his fights here in Canada and looking to make a successful UFC Canadian debut here tonight. Corey's doing a great job of going to the much body. more fluid game. Yes. Medrick, he just dropped him. Was it a slip? A little bit of a slip, but he definitely took one there. Now Starnes trying to use the jab and reach out, get inside. Clinch, can he take him down? Corey's very good in the clinch. Obviously, uh, using his experience, training with Team Quest, punch a good Greco Roman wrestlers over there. And uh, he is tough to take down. Well, you watched him on a daily basis when you were a member of the Ultimate Fighter one before his injury. Uh, everyone, fighters included, impressed with Nate Corey. One thing that stood out to me, as I said before, was that, that clinch fighting. He was excellent in the over-under position, the 50-50 position uh, that Greco-Roman wrestlers are so well known for. And uh, But he's added a lot more skill since then, Goldie. Ever-evolving everyone inside this game of mixed martial arts, especially here in the UFC. Under two minutes remains in the first round. Fight scheduled for three five-minute rounds. There's that front kick again. Oh, good combination put together by Corey, and he continues to push. Corey has Starnes backpedaling big time. I'm not sure what uh, Caleb's strategy is here. Uh, Corey is really bringing the heat, going upstairs, going downstairs with his punches, leg kicks. He looks awesome. A great and historic night here tonight. Montreal for the first time. You can watch the unaired preliminary matchups shortly after tonight's event at UFC.com. All the post-fight interviews. Log on to UFC.com and uh, trust me when I tell you we had some great free lists this evening. Knee from Starnes. But again, he's, he's got Starnes in retreat mode. Does Nate Corey pretty much this entire first round. Just missed with that knee. I don't know if he's trying to tire out Corey by getting him to chase, getting him to chase him, or if he's trying to get him to come forward and bait him in for a takedown. Oh, we haven't seen him go for it yet, though, Kenny. A little confused as to what he's trying to do. Corey really is making this fight right now. Can that actually tire out your opponent, which you talked about with the back pedal, making him chase you? Absolutely. Uh, as busy as Corey is, you know, he is in great shape, but, you know, he can only throw punches for so long and move for so long. It could tire Corey out, but Corey's continuing to go forward. 
line to that front kick, but answered by a good leg kick from Rock Quarry. Nice, heavy, heavy leg kick by and Quarry. Another. There it is again. He's letting that leg up. straight. Wow, Nate Quarry looks so fluid tonight. A dominating first round turned in by Nate Quarry. You know, with Caleb uh, retreating like he is, those leg kicks could slow him down as we go into the second and third rounds. Starnes needs a different game plan. He's open for right hand. He's open for right hand. Every time you come in, you need a one right hand. You need more right hand. You need more right hand. Straight punches, bro. Straight shots. You're moving good. That part is good. Keep your range. Throw more jabs. And land the right hand. Hook behind it. You start the front. You don't let it drop. Take a deep breath. Take You understand. Yeah. Cross it. Yeah. Yeah. He's hurt to the body. Okay. Double right or double left. Double right or double left. Overhand uppercut. He's there. Let's go. You're doing the right thing. Same thing. Going to the body is definitely part of the strategy of Nate Corey. You heard his corner say that. Corey going to the body several times to the liver. And for Caleb, they're telling him to throw that right hand. Oh, let's go. Fight, guys. Said you delivered one white right hand that scored. Keep that jab going, get it started, and throw some more combinations. We saw a ton of combinations from Corey. Starnes comes forward first. Peppered that jab out, try to come through with that right hand that his corner told him about. Corey's got some heavy hips. He's tough to take down. Wow, you could, see, you could out. see it right there, couldn't you, Kenny? Absolutely. Same spot. Caleb has done nothing to check that kick at this point. He better start checking it, or that movement, that bounce that he has in the boxing is going to go away pretty soon. See if he goes again with the leg kick. Corey, well, the reason he's landing it is he's starting it. He's not just throwing the leg kick. He's setting it up with his jabs, with his crosses. He's throwing punches and bunches and finishing with a leg kick. And again, see, he set it up with his jab that time. Excellent job by Corey. He look, really looks great. Your trainer, Mark Delagrani, says all the time, set it up, start in strong, finish strong. Absolutely. Delagrani talks about it because it's much harder to counter that. It's much harder to counter it when you're just, you know, if you throw just a leg kick, it's easy to counter. You see it coming, you're telegraphing it, throwing the punches and coming and finishing with the leg kick uh, makes it very difficult to block, even and if you can uh, block it. And he buckled him again there. And as you pointed out, he, he hasn't really checked any of those kicks. And it's slowing Caleb down now. It's starting to slow him down. He's not retreating like he was. Corey, certainly the aggressor here. Again in round two. You know, I, if I was in Corey's corner, I would advise him to kind of pin him up against the cage, try to take him down and slow him down on the ground. Maybe he's got a better shot at working his ground and pound because Caleb's kind of running away from him here. Boom, that's five strikes right there, Kenny. Late kick right in the middle. Very difficult to win a fight by retreating like that. Very difficult to win a fight by just continuously running away and going backwards. Just missed with the left uppercut, did Corey, a moment ago. Where were those kicks from Caleb early? Caleb early, he has a nice leg kick. Should have been throwing it early to sl slow Corey down. And we've talked about his good display, even in a loss, of striking his, his ever-improving striking skills against Belcher. You know, it's one thing uh, to, to work it in training and another to do it during a fight. You know, perhaps his comfort level isn't there yet. He is showing flashes of brilliance. He, he needs to be confident with the striking out there. Setting up the leg kick again, Nate Corey. Tonight, welterweight championship will be contested. Corey is killing him with that leg kick. UFC 84, May 24th, MGM Grand Garden Arena. The UFC lightweight title fight will be the main fight. J. Penn, Sean Shirt, Vanderly Silva, Keith Jardine, Tito Ortiz, and the Ultimate Cheetah. Available only on pay-per-view. Log on to 84.ufc.com. I'm guessing that uh, Kenny Florian will be watching that main event pretty closely that night. No doubt about it. <laughs> Quarry is killing him with that leg kick. Opening finally. himself up for a takedown, but he's back to his feet. Immediately got back up, but finally he timed it, caught the leg, and took Quarry down, but just for a, for a millisecond. Now that Quarry's landing that leg kick, I would start to work the upstairs, I would start to work the head kick. Caleb does not like getting hit in the leg. Corey should start taking it upstairs and go up to his head. He's dropping that, he's dropping that hand too. 
He should take it upstairs and surprise him with a head kick. Heavy hips by Quarry. Heavy hips. And again, I, I, this looks like a brand new Nate Quarry. And he it, looks great. And it, and it didn't seem just visibly by looking at him yesterday that the cut was very easy. He wondered if there would be some fatigue, but wow, does he really look improved here tonight inside the octagon? Caleb. Especially adding in all those leg kicks, Kenny. Caleb looks like he's kind of just give him, giving him sparring practice. You know, he's kind of yeah. just in and out. He doesn't, he's not really coming at him with any real intensity or focus to finish the fight. He's kind of walking away here. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not really sure what his game plan was for this fight. Well, if this is sparring practice, Corey needs to stop kicking him in the leg so hard. <laughs> Corey's real, really being a jerk. He's going hard in that sparring <laughs> session, I'll tell you that. And wow. again. You can hear that slap, and he's landing that leg straight. It's like a baseball bat. You get hit with that thing on the leg enough times. I mean, think Charlie Horse times 10. Remember years ago, we talked about Pedro Hizzo's vicious leg kicks. Now, modern day, a kid like Tiago Alves has some vicious leg kicks. And it is, as you said, like a baseball bat landing on your thigh. Final 10 seconds of the second round. Not impressed with Canada's own Caleb Starnes, but they should be impressed with the performance of Nate Quarry. They can't be booing Nate Quarry. Nate Quarry doing has not everything. Been <laughs> He's doing everything possible to make this an exciting fight. And uh, Caleb, the Canadians, uh, just kind of circling away from him. You know, Kenny, as you've talked about so far in the first 10 minutes of the fight, the key to the kicks and the success of the kicks of Quarry have been the fact that he set him up, he's mixed him up, he started with the jab, with the hands, he's finished with them. He's definitely not telegraphing anything, especially his kicks. It's confusing him. Boom, he's going upstairs, he starts blocking the punches, opens up to a kick. He's doing it several times throughout the first and second round. It's going to be interesting to see how it's effective Caleb's movement, especially I don't see anybody massaging his legs. His legs are there stiff. No one's massaging his legs out. His legs aren't kicked out. That's when your legs start to stiffen up. You, you know, maybe unfairly we forgot about Nate Corey because he was out so long with the back injury and stuff. But when you really look at it, he's lost only two times in his career overall. He's lost only one time in the UFC. And that just happened to be to middleweight champion Rich Franklin. Middleweight champion at the time, of course in the title fight back at UFC 56. No shame in that loss to, uh, to, to Rich Franklin. Uh, he's a completely different fighter since then. As you can see, you know, Quarry uh, hasn't been sitting on the couch and eating potato chips uh, since that fight. He's really got some great skills. You know, I, again, that question has been answered. Who's next for Anderson Silva? You know, who might be in line? Travis Luter wants another chance. He's got to beat Franklin, though. Franklin would love one, but he's lost twice, so Rich knows he'll have to wait. But Bisman comes out and looks tremendous. And now Quarry at 185, as he has been for a long time, though, looks the best he ever has. Uh, the 185 pound division is kind of wide open right now. Everyone's trying to look and, and try to get to that number one contender spot. Corey sees that. You can see the hunger in his eyes. He's doing everything possible to take Caleb Starnes out of this fight. The it's just tough to fight someone who doesn't want to fight. Yeah, the demise of all of those that are going to compete against Anderson Silva may have been uh, greatly exaggerated. <laughs> Four minutes remains. Starnes is going to look for a home run hit, Kenny. At least he should. There's no way he's going to walk away with a decision. It's his only chance at this point. Uh, he's starting to drop those hands down. His legs are taking a beating. He's tough. Uh, he's tough. I mean, he's taking some shots, but you'll see how he's kind of lifting up that leg now. He's not moving as quickly and with that sense of urgency that he did early on. He's planting that leg, and it could get worse for his leg when the kicks keep coming. Yeah, it's, it's like a stiff leg now instead of, you know, the bend in the knee. And again, Corey, could, could this just simply be a case of the fact that, and I've heard you say it before, Starnes just could never find his range and get comfortable tonight? No doubt about it. And, you know, he keeps backing up. I, you know, I don't I don't know how you can really get too much offense if you're backing up like that. Corey's really just picking him apart, uh, you know, coming with uh, just a variation of strikes. And, uh, you know, if Caleb sits low in his head like that, I think Corey should go up to, to a tight clinch position, try to take him out with some knees going up right to the chin. Very few can be offensive in a defensive position. Chuck Liddell's good at it, backing up and still being able to attack, as he did against Babalu. But Starn's not able to do any countering when he's in retreat mode. 
Chuck Liddell's timing is a difference, though. He'll plant, he'll plant, get off at an angle, and make his opponent pay. Caleb is just kind of going backwards without really sitting on his punches, just kind of throwing out a couple jabs and continuously going backwards. A very different uh, movement. Thousands in attendance here tonight and watching all around the world. And a good showing put on by Nate Corey. Caleb Starnes just switched his stance. He just switched his stance. That lead leg is taking a beating. He's gone back to his old stance, but uh, now he risks uh, getting that leg beat up more. He did switch his stance, so obviously uh, you can see it. The leg kicks are affecting him. You know, it, it almost, again, it, it makes you wonder, is Caleb injured? Is he uh, not injured badly, but not 100%? Is he, is he ill? Because this doesn't look like the same Caleb Starnes that we saw against Belcher, Levin, or even Okami when he lost in that fight. You're right. I mean, I'm, I'm questioning whether, uh, you know, he was 100% for this fight. Was he injured? Uh, I'm not sure. If He's just kind of trying to survive out there. Great and point. there it is. That, that knee almost came through. That's what Corey needs to do is get a hold of that head, slow him down, keep him in front of him, and just uh, take him out from there because the movement of Starnes is just really frustrating for Corey right now. The Ultimate Fighter one veteran, Nate Corey, dominant here tonight. Ultimate Fighter continues. Team Rampage versus Team Forest. Wednesdays at 10 on Spike. Wednesdays and Fridays on Rogers. Sportsnet right here in Canada. Check your local listings. Final 65 seconds. Corey's measuring. Caleb at this point has to know that he's down on the judges' cards. I mean, uh, he needs to do something major. Throw a big overhand right, something. Look at the way that he moves now. Watch, focus in on the left lead leg. It's, all, it's almost like he's moving with a limp, Kenny. Absolutely. Uh, that's got to be hurting him at this point. See that? Uh, See? You can get a good look at it. He's not on, on the ball of his foot anymore. Uh, he's kind of stepping more flat now. And there it is again. That hurt him. That hurt him. Corey's got to finish him right here. 30 seconds remains of the fight. Oh, wow. Nate Quarry. I don't think we need to translate what that I meant. I know exactly what that <laughs> meant. Can't come into the octagon and use the marathon technique. I thought he was doing the running man. Personally, well, that would I don't be know. the marathon it technique. Like the running That's man. running. Yeah. Get it? Marathon, you run, Kenny. Okay. <laughs> I can go slower if you want. Quarry so Joe would have got that. <laughs> Quarry. Wow. Interesting technique by Corey. He's throwing hammer strikes. <laughs> Corey wow. just obviously frustrated. What a performance by Corey, though. He did everything possible to make that fight an exciting fight. Unbelievable. He's changed incredibly since his last fight, let alone the ultimate fighter. Well, I think he told us the same thing that you told us. Not supposed to run or just be in a defensive mode, but Starnes was. And in all fairness to Caleb Starnes, very uncharacteristically, he was. There it is, Quarry once again with those vicious leg kicks. I mean, he brought it. Listen to the crowd. The Canadian crowd is cheering for this guy, and he deserves it. Unbelievable. Yeah, they love that. The running man. <laughs> now, see, and now, now Starnes is ticked off. Now Starnes won't shake his hand. Nor is the corner of Caleb Starnes impressed. A little uncharacteristic of Nate Corey, but comical nonetheless. And right now, Caleb Starnes is getting booed like Marcus Naslin of the Vancouver Fuck Canucks you. would. Here's Why the Bell Center. Fighting, if he had just Fuck scored you. a hat trick against Le Habitant, the Montreal Fuck Canadiens. You. But if there's something to be said by Starnes, he's 15 minutes too late. Nate Corey, very religious, raised a Jehovah's Witness, did not play any sports until later in life. Lost his father a few years ago, but he has a great heart and showed some great skills here this evening. As undoubtedly we are about to have the official announcement from Bruce Buffer of a unanimous decision victory. The Montreal crowd reacting to the 
to the man who's on the big screen. Now it starts with Booze. Here's Bruce Buffer. Ladies and gentlemen, after three rounds, we go to the judges' scorecards for a decision. Doug Crosby scores the contest 30 26. Nelson Hamilton has it 30 27. And Pasquale Procopio scores it 30 24 for the winner. Wow. And Logan Young, Nathan Rock Quarry. That may be the first 30 24 that we've had in UFC history. That is as unanimous as it comes. Here's Kenny. How did you go from getting punched in the face to having this job? <laughs> I want that job. <laughs> Nate Corey, you won over this amazing crowd here in Montreal. Uh, did, did you think it would turn into a road race like it did? I mean, you did everything possible to push this fight. How frustrated were you out there? Uh, well, you know, no disrespect to Caleb. It's tough when you come out here to fight. Uh, I know a few times I've been hit to get the hell out of there. So I didn't mean to disrespect him or his camp. He's a great guy. I just, I came to fight. It's tough to, to land a shot when somebody's moving backwards on you. So I did the best I could. I apologize for not getting the finish. Well, I don't think this crowd is faulting you for that. You brought everything you could. I mean, talk about your striking skills. I mean, since the last fight you showed, I mean, just phenomenal Muay Thai. You threw every strike in the book. Uh, you know, tell us about what you've been doing with your striking game. I, I was just incredibly impressed. Well, I, I've got to put it all to my coaches. I'm just a lump of clay in my kickbox. My Muay Thai coach, Jeremy Wires, uh, Mr. Daniel Burke, boxing coach Leonard Trigg have worked on me so much on my hands and on my clinch that, you know, it can't help but go up because I started from nothing. So it, it's all credit to them. Uh, tell us about those kicks. Uh, did you see that he was hurt with him? You obviously kept working that. Uh, he didn't really check him. You kept going with it. What'd you see out there? Uh, I kept trying to land that hard 10 to the leg. I figured it would take some of his gas away, and it seemed to work. I, I should have been kicking him in the calves, I guess, so he couldn't move backwards as fast. But I, I did the best I could. Uh, I had so much great help coming up for this fight from the sports lab up in Portland, Oregon. Guys from uh, New Jersey Martial Arts came out, some black belts in jiu-jitsu. Tim and Marco came out to work with me. It, it's just been an incredible camp. Not only did you win this fight, you won over this crowd. Congratulations, Nate. Well, when I... When I first came into the camp, when I, when I first came in, I heard some boos, and I, I know I, I didn't know how to feel like that. I was kind of like, yo, okay. But then as, as the fight went on, I figured if you can change, and I can change, <laughs> anybody can change! Good job, bro. Unbelievable. And we thought that Matt Sarah who's gonna be Rocky IV. How good is that? Nate Corey, showing a ton of personality and great and improved Muay Thai skills in front of the original Ultimate Fighter, Forrest Griffin, here tonight. And with his Jersey Le Habitant, the Montreal Canadiens, Forrest Griffin, Set to take on none other than Rampage later for the title, but first things first, title fight tonight. Montreal's native son, George Rush St. Pierre, taking on Matt, the Terra Sarah. The crowd reacts even to a shot of Sarah inside his locker room. He's angry today, determined to shock the world again. What do you think? Well, as the voting was earlier, 65-35, Kenny. Now it's 58-42. Thousands amongst thousands have been heard. And you can continue to log on to UFC.com to vote or text A for Sarah, B for St. Pierre to 88222 all night long. Our text voting brought to you by Tap Out. 58-42. A lot of people think that Sarah did not win that first fight as it being a fluke and that he can do it again. And the fans of George Rush St. Pierre are all over this fine province, this great city, and in attendance tonight, ready for GSP to become the undisputed welterweight champion. Coming up next, former UFC middleweight champion, Rich Ace Franklin enters the octagon to try to take down Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt, Travis Luter. And later tonight, it is our main event of the evening for the undisputed UFC welterweight championship as Matt the Terracera faces French-Canadian Montreal, Quebec's own George Rush St. Pierre.
If I can change and you can change, then why can't we change? Continuing with the aforementioned Rich Franklin in the middleweight division. He once held the belt for 14 months. Now he looks to rebound from a loss to Silva by taking out Travis Booter. And it is all over. And After the Anderson Silva fight in October, I had talked to the UFC about taking some time off. It was my intention to not fight until June. The day after he signed uh, the fight with me, he, he said that he supposedly, he got hurt that day. I had surgery on my knee January 3rd. Yeah, I say bull I, I say that he, I don't think he was hurt. He had a bad day that last time, you know, and I wouldn't want to have two bad days in my hometown. Maybe that's in the back of his head. Things were going my way. I had great first round until, uh, until that 10 second call came. Silva clipped me on the chin and from that point on, I was just pretty much a sitting duck. I was supposed to get killed by Silva. I was beating him you know, every minute of the fight right up until he won. I want to fight Anderson. I want to get back to Anderson. He probably doesn't want to fight Anderson. I have Travis on my plate and, and he's of uh, the utmost important to me right now. If I go out there and win, I, I think it puts me back in contention. I think it's very possible I could get a title shot. I, th I don't think that there's a long list of guys going, hey, I want to fight Anderson. Let me, let me, let me. And I'm one of those guys. I'm probably the only guy right now. I don't like uh, talking about future opponents like that until, until you've done your job. He's not going to want to be on his back against me. He probably wouldn't mind being on top. But could he take me down? I don't think so. I think I can put him on his back. I need to defend the takedown and, and, and throw some punches. If he wants to keep the fight standing up, I'll be a bit surprised. I could stand up there and bang with him, but I'd much rather take him to my strength. The fight goes to the ground, the fight's mine. I want to take his arm or his neck with me. his first return to the Octagon since the infamous Anderson Silva matchup 14 months ago. Well documented, he was not able to make way. It was embarrassing to him, many others. He says, though, it was a mixed calculation, if you will. And you know what? The most impressive thing that came out of the bad situation is he hung with Anderson Silva about as well as anybody has done so far here in the UFC. He has, and I think that's his source of motivation now, going forward now. Um, you know, he mentioned Anderson Silva several times. Yeah. He wants to get back there, and uh, Rich Franklin's in his way here. And whoever it is that's in his way, he wants to get him out so he can fight Anderson Silva again. He has done the best uh, job against Anderson Silva, and uh, he says that fight was his. That was his fight. He lost that fight, and, uh, you know, it was the weight cut, and uh, he's not going to make that mistake again. I think another thing is he gets an offering of good luck from his corner men, including Mark Delagratis at Yotam Boy Thai Academy, your coach, standing in the corner tonight for Travis Luter, as he did the last time that Luter fought, even in defeat to Silva. He said the one thing he wants to get across to everybody, Kenny, he's, he's not a bad guy. He wasn't trying to be disrespectful to the ultimate fighter for the comeback and the opportunity to fight for the title, which obviously changed the life of Matt Serra. He said it was a miscalculation. I just want to put it all behind me, move forward, and beat Rich Franklin tonight. And that's the only thing left for him to do. You have to move forward in situations like that. Um, you need to look at ways to improve that. He has. He made the weight easily now. And, uh, you know, it, it just made him uh, that much more focused on making weight, making sure he's working out. And uh, this is as motivated as Travis Luter uh, has been for any fight. It's uh, comical, interesting. Yesterday when he officially made weight at the weigh-ins, Kind of just gave the crowd a little look like, whew, I finally did it, but he really did. He had no problem making weight. 
He thinks that if he pressures Franklin early, takes him down, he has an excellent chance to win. But he's got to beat the former longtime middleweight champion. Wins over McDonald and Okami. Then suffered the same fate in his hometown of Cincinnati, losing to Silva a second time. But Franklin, you can look in his eyes, has a look of hunger, determination. He unfortunately lost his father, Richard Sr., within the last few months, 56 years old, way too young, needless to say. That may be part of it. Knowing he's not fighting Anderson Silva may be part of it. Feeling he's got an inner strength and a belief might be part of it, or maybe the fact that he spent a month in Seattle training with Matt Hume for this fight. He's changed it up. Uh, he brought in Matt Hume for his last fight uh, against Anderson Silva as well. But he knows. He's an intelligent fighter. He knows he had to switch it up. That's a problem with a lot of veteran fighters. They think they know it all. Franklin, as smart as he is, knows that he needs to make improvements. Went, switched it up with his camp. And uh, from what I hear, he's made some great changes and some great improvements in his game. Joe Rogan said early in Franklin's career, he looked like an angry Jim Carrey. Well, he looks like an angry Jim Carrey here tonight as Rich Franklin looks to attempt to return to his winning ways. Significant what you talked about, training with you. Franklin will be one to admit now that he wishes he would have spent more time with Matt Hume prior to the second fight against Silva. This time, he didn't leave anything to be doubted. He spent, as I mentioned, a full month away from home in Seattle with one of the best in the business, Matt Hume. Our tale of the tape for our co-main event of the evening in the middleweight division. Rich Ace Franklin, the former champion, 33 years old, one year younger than Travis Luter. Franklin, two inches taller. He will have a one-inch reach advantage. Who will walk away the victor and get right back into the title picture? Here's the official introductions from Bruce Buffer. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the co-main event of the evening. Our sponsors for this contest are Edge Shave Gel, Get Your Edge, and Tap Out, American, Arrogant, and In Your Face. Watch Tap Out in their crazy second season starting this June. And now, three rounds in the UFC middleweight division. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner, a Brazilian jiu-jitsu fighter holding a professional record of 12 wins with four losses. He stands 5 feet 11 inches tall, weighing in at 185 pounds. Fighting out of Fort Worth, Texas, Travis the Serial Killer. And now introducing his opponent, fighting out of the red corner, a freestyle fighter, holding a professional record of 24 wins with three losses. He stands six feet one inch tall, weighing in at 185 pounds. Fighting out of Cincinnati, Ohio, he is the former UFC middleweight champion of the world.
action begins. Our referee in charge of this contest is Steve Mazzagatti. All right, gentlemen, this will be a clean and fair fight. You need to obey my commands, protect yourself at all times. Now let's hook them up. Good luck. Rich Franklin receiving a great ovation here at the Bell Center. Travis Luter looking to rectify what has gone wrong in the past, that being missing weight against Anderson Silva. Our fight clock brought to you by AVPR, unrated on DVD and Blu-ray today. You know, there are times where uh, both fighters kind of are unsure what the other guy's gonna do. This isn't one of those fights. Absolutely classic striker against Grappler. Franklin's tough enough he can get away with brown and pink trunks. Rich Franklin with a nice knee. Caught, caught Travis on the way in. Travis just wants this Little looks hurt, Franklin he's going for that single leg. Looks like he's recovered nicely. Rich Franklin had to have known he was gonna go for that single leg with that leg forward as a southpaw. And he's doing a good job of defending. Grabbing that wrist, not allowing him to switch to a double leg. I mean, Franklin's ground skills, we haven't seen them a ton, Kenny, but they're they're pretty darn good, way above average. Working with, of course, George Grigel. Rob Radford in his corner tonight, along with Matt Hume. A brown belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is uh, no easy task. Uh, Rich Franklin, a brown belt under George Grigel. Luter is gonna take his back here. He's gotta be careful. Franklin's gotta be careful here. You hear the corner of Franklin saying to break his hands, break the, the grip of Travis Luter. This is probably the worst possible position to be in. It's Luter trying to take your back. Luter, see if he can get some hooks in, Kenny. Franklin doing a good job of not allowing those hooks to come in. Luter is staying patient, beating him up there. What did we say? I said a moment ago that Luter thought if he could pressure him early, get him down early in the fight, he would have an excellent chance of winning. The question is, can he finish him, and does he have the gas to keep going? Got him right where he wants to be. He's in side mount. He's got good pressure. This is where Travis is at his best. He's very heavy here. He's got great pressure, great positioning skills. And he's setting Franklin up for Carlos, a mount or a submission. Carlos Machado, black belt. Travis Luter in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Luter trying to get to the full mount. Great job by Franklin, keeping that underhook, that kind of half butterfly guard. Wow, great job, Luter guard. Luter staying heavy, working a pass. Franklin doing a good job of getting the underhook. He let go of that underhook, should have kept it. He needs to get back to his feet here, obviously. Doesn't want to be here for Pulls too right long. back into guard. Good job by Rich Franklin, we just said a moment ago. We haven't really seen his ground skills displayed very often. Doing a good job against one of the best at this type of fight, Travis Luter. Great defensive skills by Franklin. Franklin has lost to two men in his mixed martial arts career. Anderson Silva on two occasions, and Lioto Machida, who's still unbeaten in his mixed martial arts career. Travis has that underhook, trying to work, work for a way around the guard of Rich Franklin. He has a, has a hook, he's gonna push down on that leg and slide that right leg through as he's doing right there, and right in the mount. To this the is where Luter's dangerous. 155 remains in round one, so Luter's got a lot of time to work on Franklin here. If I were Luter, I would be patient here, look for my opportunity to kind of get this ground and pound going, to set up a choker and arm lock. You hear it exactly what you just said, take your time. Now he's gonna try to finish with the arm bar. Franklin able to just wow. spin out of it. What an escape by Franklin, that is a high level counter right there. He was in big trouble. Luda transitioned beautifully into arm bar. His arm was locked out. Franklin really impressed me with that counter. Franklin, Franklin inadvertently caught Travis Luter on that kick. In the wrong place, he apologized immediately. They're back on their feet. That, that was razor close. You saw Franklin almost think about tapping there with the arm bar, spun out of it neatly. And now let's see what Rich Franklin can do. Good sprawl, and again, Rich Franklin wasn't a champion in this division for no reason. Um, obviously showing some high-level Brazilian jiu-jitsu. That was beautiful to watch. Now Franklin trying to score some points. This is where Franklin has to make Luter pay. He needs to 
at the very least, if he is going to take him down, get Luter to expend some energy, beat him up with his hands, beat him up with some knees. Wow, relentless, though, is Travis Luter on that leg. 30 seconds remains in round number one. Franklin Good trying to tee up on Franklin. Travis Luter. Great job by Franklin. Still, he can't get the leg free, though, Kenny. Luter's very determined to work that takedown, doing a good job, showing some determination and tenacity here. He's got him up against the cage, and this is where he can take him down on a double leg. Franklin is very good at countering that single leg position. Right in front of Matt Hume. Good place to be if you're Rich Franklin in front of your cornerman, George Grigiel. Nice knees, nice knees by Franklin. Franklin survives the jiu-jitsu skills of Luter. Excellent round by both guys. That's a tough one to judge. I'd give the edge to Luter. He almost finished Franklin there. Got the better position on the ground, but it was Franklin who came back at the end of the round to give Luter some problems. That's a sweet arm bar right there. That is gorgeous work right there by Luter. And what a counter by Franklin. Great stuff. Try to stay away from him. Yeah. That's when he's getting you tied up is when you're underhooking. So just try to stuff and get your hips back or run him over. Okay. okay? And then once you're stuffing his head down and going in there, butt bump, okay? Fight it a little while, butt bump, and just fly out of there. Yeah, Don't leave your ankle it. behind you. Keep your hands up, okay? You gotta wear him out this next round. Hey, gentlemen. Get a little bit of water. You gotta wear him out, okay? I know you're not tired. Come on, everything you got you worked for. Come on. I know that voice. Mark Deligrati tell him to keep his hands up. That's good advice. Uh, Franklin has taken out many a fighter on the feet. And, uh, you know, Luter may have spent some energy there. Uh, he's kind of breathing a little heavy there. Franklin looks ready to go. On paper, Kenny, many believed if this fight got into deep water, and it's not a five-round fight, three in a non-title situation, but the deeper it got, the great conditioning throughout the career of Rich Franklin would reign supreme. Certainly, Rich uh, Franklin is known for his uh, strength and conditioning routine. Um, right now, it's frustrating for Travis. He had to kind of flop to his back. And uh, even still, as good as the jiu-jitsu is, I still don't think that's where he wants to be. He wants to be on top. That's where he's dangerous. And uh, Franklin's on to him. He's uh, taken away that single leg entry for him. Trying to exit with the knee was Franklin. Now, Luter takes a head kick in that wobble, though. Luter's in big trouble. Rich Franklin looking to finish the fight. Got to be careful not to leave that ankle behind. That's the thing with Luter. He always gets a hold of something. Kind of like the Frank Mir Brock Lesnar situation. Like, okay, don't leave it out there very long because I'll crack it. Luter is very dangerous still. He doesn't have his far leg trapped. So Franklin can roll out of it. He can't escape. He needs to trap that far leg, and Franklin did. He, he got out. This is giving Travis Luter some time to recover. Luter's this fight was nearly over. Luter's taking his time, getting up to his feet. That doesn't look like a good sign. It looks like he's tired. And Franklin's making a pay with those knees. Great job of holding the head and coming up through to the body with knees. How about the irony of Franklin working the clinch so well? Caught him with the right hand. Luter's hands are gone. Luter's gas tank is empty. His hands are in front of his stomach. This could be nasty. And there's a saying, oh. fatigue makes cowards of men. And uh, right now, Luda looks fatigued. Oh, more than fatigued. Let's see if he throws another knee. Boom. Franklin working that plump position. He's kind of have a half tie clinch there. Dirty boxing. Down he goes again, but he'll hang on to the leg. Now, Luter being cornered tonight by Mark Delagrati because he said, I want one of the best in the business in my corner, but he didn't spend a ton of time at Team, uh, team Signal Tom preparing for this fight. Just a couple of days, and he really depends on his jiu-jitsu. But right now, he doesn't have the gas tank to utilize his jiu-jitsu. You know, he did. He only spent a few days. You know, it's, it's, it's going to take more than 48 hours or three days, you know, a few months to really improve your striking. And, uh, you know, Luter still knows where he needs to take this fight. He, he knew he had to take this fight to the ground. He's not going to transition to a world-class striker overnight. Wow. And uh, right now, uh, he's paying for that lack of experience on the feet right now. And lack of conditioning. This is just, this is just pretty much in the books for Rich Franklin. Hands are down. I'm waiting for a left hand like it was against Nate Corey right now, the way that Luter's down. Franklin looking to finish. Luter's all done. It is all over! Rich Franklin!
has defeated Travis Luter. Franklin showed some serious patience, some serious maturity as a fighter out there. Did a great job of, of countering his takedowns, of wearing down Travis Luter with knees to the body, with knees to the head. Phenomenal job by Rich Franklin. Travis Luter tried to win it early, couldn't, ran out of gas. Franklin took over and dominated. Nice head kick. That wobbled Frank, that wobbled Luter. Beautiful head kick. Landed almost right on the neck. And there's Franklin finishing him off. Great job by Rich Franklin. Luter was done. He was spent. What was most impressive was the submission defense and the work on the back of Rich Franklin. Big hug from his best friend, longtime training partner, George Gurgel. Between Gurgel and Hume, that work on his back, utilizing the guard, paid off. It paid huge dividends tonight. Rich Franklin and our good friend Niner, Craig Conley. Franklin's so happy he'll hug anybody right now. Luter just able to get up right now. He is absolutely exhausted. Maybe he didn't make the weight cut as easily as we thought. Bruce Buffer has the official decision. Ladies and gentlemen, referee Steve Mazzagatti has called a stop to this contest at three minutes, one second of round number two. Declaring the winner and La Gagnon by TKO, Rich. Franklin! 301 of the second, Franklin. Back in the winner's circle. He's inside the octagon with Kenny Florian. Hey, good looking. Awesome. Rich, phenomenal job. Uh, you showed why you were a champion in this very tough division. Uh, you knew that Luter wanted to take you to, take you to the ground. He had you in some difficult positions. You showed some amazing counters and defensive skills. What were you thinking when he had you mounted? He almost had you in the armbar. What was going through your mind there? I was just trying to build a false sense of confidence in Luter. <laughs> now, you know, we, we trained defending the takedown time and time again. I knew that he was going to shoot the way he did, get my lead leg, try to put me against the fence. Uh, that's exactly what we trained not to do. And he took me to the ground. I got a little complacent. I was comfortable, not, not wearing myself out. Luter is known for uh, his lack of conditioning. So, you know, I waited. He went for the arm bar and I escaped. I was just going to say, was that part of your strategy? Uh, you seemed to wear on him. You, you made him pay every time he missed a shot. Was that part of the strategy to wear him down? Yeah, definitely. We wanted to make sure that every time he took a shot, he was paying for it, whether it was with a, with a strike or some sort of conditioning. Hey, I want to say thanks to the Canadian fans here. Yesterday, yesterday when I walked out to the weigh-ins, these guys booed everybody that wasn't Canadian. I was standing backstage, all across my fingers like, oh, please, don't boo me too. You guys are great. Great crowd, I'd love to come back. You know, Jim Carrey's Canadian. I think it had something to do with that. You look like Jim Carrey, who's Canadian. I think they thought you were Jim Carrey. Yeah. Unbelievable job. Canada loves Rich Franklin. Hey, I want to say thanks to all the guys in Cincinnati that helped me get ready before I went up to Matt Humes in Seattle. Thanks to all my coaches. Hey, hey, what's up to the guys in Fort Benning? And I want to say thanks to God. Praise to him. Hey, listen to Ben Stiller talking to Jim Carrey inside the octagon. This was the second time that Rich Franklin fought in Montreal, and he wins a big one here tonight, defeating Travis Luter, and proving that there is a lot of fight left inside ace. Rich Franklin, the former longtime UFC middleweight champion. All right, this one is the main event. Look how close the voting has become. Tens of thousands have let their voice be heard all night long, and now it's almost an even matchup. St. Pierre with a slight advantage at UFC.com and our text voters all over. We thank you for your continued participation and support of the UFC. Sarah St. Pierre, the main event of the evening, still ahead here tonight live.
from the sold out Bell Center, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. An attendance record set this evening as we get set for what is one of the biggest main events in UFC history. A final look inside the locker room of UFC welterweight champion, Matt Serra, who tonight looks to prove that the first time he defeated George St. Pierre was not a fluke. And there you see George St. Pierre inside his locker room. He plans on putting on a great show and becoming once again the undisputed UFC welterweight champion. Be sure to pick up the newly released DVD, Aliens vs. Predator Requiem, to see how these two otherworldly foes matched up in battle. And speaking of matching up, let's take a look at how the champion, Matt Serra, and the challenger, George St. Pierre, match up. Goldie, I'm gonna give the striking advantage to George St. Pierre. However, the power advantage to Matt Serra. We saw what he did in his last fight against GSP. He definitely has knockout power. Takedown game is gonna go to George St. Pierre. He's been working with the Canadian Olympic wrestling team. Submissions gotta go with Matt Serra. He's a world champion in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Let's talk about the intangibles. I'm gonna give the advantage to Matt Serra in the mental game. He's coming in here with a brutal knockout win over George St. Pierre. George is fighting in his hometown. He needs to deal with the pressure of the hometown crowd and overcome the memory of that devastating loss. The matchup of the night brought to you by EVPR Unrated on DVD and Blu-ray today. Oh, this anticipation has built up for months, and here in Montreal, there is no one in the game of mixed martial arts more famous than George St. Pierre. He fights Matt Serra in our main event of the evening. You will hear truly a hero's welcome in a moment, and if you think Matt Serra is the villain, well, you're going to find out for certain. He is number one enemy tonight here in the province of Le Quebec in the Montreal Bell Center. Mike Bolger, Kenny Florian, once again, our good friend Joe Rogan watching at home, some great family obligations. Joe was interested in this one because he always talked about the crazy monkey jiu-jitsu of Matt Serra. But it's not just the great skills of Matt Serra, it's the true confidence of this man. No one believed that he could beat St. Pierre once. He did it, and he truly believes he's going to do it again. It, it used to be the case where everyone was afraid of Matt Serra's right. jiu-jitsu. Uh, but now, after that knockout win over George St. Pierre, you got to fear his hands as well. Uh, he's really developed his game, training with Ray Longo, Heavy, heavy hands. I mean, George St. Pierre found out, and uh, whether he, whether he's nervous or not about that last fight, it was the hands that took him out. It was early. It wasn't like, you know, he, he had to overcome being tired or not training. It was early in the fight, and it was a strong right hand that took him out. George St. Pierre is coming off perhaps the most dominant win of his UFC career over future Hall of Famer Matt Hughes absolutely dominant throughout the whole fight. He says he continues to get better every day, not just physically, but perhaps, Kenny, more importantly, mentally. You know, uh, George St. Pierre believes he's at the top of his game. Uh, he showed that he can come back from a loss, right. uh, fighting Josh Koscheck, uh, out-wrestling Josh Koscheck, uh, taking Matt Hughes out in every aspect. I mean, uh, George St. Pierre is ready for this fight. George Rush St. Pierre, hoping to enjoy the greatest moment of his life the greatest moment of his fighting career as he gets set to try to become the welterweight champion and wear what he calls the real belt once again. All night long, the texts have come in, Kenny. They've actually turned out to be pretty even at 52-48 last count. Now 54-46, close all night at UFC.com, close all night at our text voting station, 88222. Our texting tonight, of course, brought to you by our good friends at Tap Out. American, arrogant, and in your face. So the wait, Kenny, is finally over. Tonight we find out if it was an aberration or if there will be validation to the skills of Matt the Terracera as only one man will leave the undisputed welterweight champion. already talking about the next fight. Who, who is GSP fighting next? They weren't talking about me. This is a, a very deep, talented pool, the 170 pound division, and this man is without a doubt at the top of it. And I heard this. I heard, I, I put a smile on my face when I hear it, man. This guy has all the 
attributes of a champion. And he's only getting better every day. You can count some people out. Don't ever count me out. Ever. After the fight, George was great, you know, he was respectful, he was a gentleman. I have no excuse, I was in great shape, my training was very good, and congratulations to Matt Sarah. You know, when I heard him on the Canadian radio station saying how, you know, he shouldn't have took the fight, and, he, you know, it was Matt Sarah, I could beat him easy, it's like, hey, dude, you're one, you're either you're lying before or after, which one is it? Everywhere I was going, Everybody was like asking me the same question. What happened to you and stuff like that? So I, I didn't say nothing in the beginning, you know, but it keep go, keep coming and keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going until the point that I couldn't take it. And then Matt Saro made, uh, was pretty pissed off. He made a big story about it. It was extremely disrespectful. And to me, that's when he crossed the line and I just, I retaliated and let him know, hey man, you know, F me, F you, dude. Go drink a glass of red wine and go watch a hockey game. He's not only insulting me, he's insulting a bunch of people, all the Francophone people. A world champion should not act like this. You cross the line first, and then I say something, and then you're offended by what I say? Screw you, man. Don't open your mouth, and we won't have any problems. When you say stuff like that, you know you have to pay for it. I know that this guy is going to have to want to come back and make an example of me, and I'm not going to be making an example of him. This, this guy has no idea of how strong I could be, how fast, how powerful I can be. He has no idea. You want to show me the real GSP? Show it to me, man. I'll be there. A lot of things has been said, but I will, I wait, I'm waiting to answer back with my fist. I'm not the guy to tap last time. I'm not the guy to say uncle, you know? I'm not the guy to get beat down when I shouldn't have got beaten down. And we'll see what happens. Emotional. However, he says he's not going to fight with emotion. He's going to fight with his head. He's going to go in there, show Matt Serra that it was a fluke. It was a fluke. Kenny, you bring up an excellent point. How important is it that St. Pierre doesn't get too caught up in the moment and start to fight with reckless abandon? You know, you start to forget about your game plan. You start to forget about what you train for, you know? It's so important that you stick to the game plan, getting too emotional, too excited, you know, uh, it really, it takes away from that. Bill Nurse, Drake Jackson, of course, one of the best trainers in the business today. 
His partner, fellow French Canadian David Loazzo, and here he is, George St. Pierre, entering the octagon in Montreal. Twenty-one thousand plus in attendance tonight. George St. Pierre says he's going to show everyone something that they've never seen before. What could that be? What does he have planned for Matt Serra? I would love to know. Be between the ears of St. Pierre right now, because we've pretty much seen everything out of this tremendously talented athlete. The man we thought would rule 170 for a long, long time until Matt Serra. Shot the world. Shock the world again. He's got to do what he did last time. Put the pressure on George from the beginning. I believe this is exactly what he's going to do. And uh, we can see uh, Matt Serra leave this place with the belt. This is our main event of the evening. Our tale of the tape for this welterweight title fight. It's brought to you by the only motorcycles worthy of being in the octagon, Harley Davidson. Sarah the American, seven years the elder of the French Canadian. St. Pierre, four inches taller, has an incredible eight inch reach advantage, but we all remember, it didn't matter last time. Bruce Bumper with the introductions of our main event. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the main event of the evening. Two UFC welterweight warriors have now entered the world's ultimate proving ground for fighters where they will face off against each other for the second time. But tonight, only one will leave the champion. This UFC championship bout 
is sanctioned by the Reggie de Acolde de Course Eight de Ju. Our three judges scoring this contest at Octagon side are Doug Crosby, Nelson Hamilton, and Pasquale Procopio. And when the action begins, our referee in charge of this contest is Eve Levine. This championship belt is sponsored by the only motorcycles worthy of being in the octagon, Harley Davidson. And AVP are unrated on DVD and Blu-ray today. And now, this is the moment you've all been waiting for. Live from the sold-out Bell Center in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, it's time! Five rounds for the USC Welterweight Championship of the World! Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner. This man is a wrestler and Brazilian jiu-jitsu fighter, holding a professional record of 15 wins with two losses. He stands five feet, 10 inches tall, Weighing in at 169 and one half pounds. Fighting out of Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Ladies and gentlemen, he is the former UFC welterweight champion, George Rush St. Pierre. And now, introducing his opponent, Fighting out of the red corner, this man is a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu fighter, holding a professional record of 16 wins with four losses. He stands five feet six inches tall, weighing in at 169 and one half pounds. Fighting out of East Meadow, New York, ladies and gentlemen, he is the reigning, defending UFC welterweight champion of the world. Guys, UFC belt on the line tonight. Protect yourself at all time. Obey my command at all time. If you want to touch that, do it now. Go back. Wow. What? I can't hear you. Exactly. <laughs> Fight Clock brought to you by ABPR Unrated on DVD and Blu ray today. E for B. Ready to start our main event of the evening. Sarah. Against St. Pierre. Ready? And here we go again. St. Pierre right for the takedown. A lot of people thought he would stand up with Sarah. He takes him right down, gets the half guard. Sarah, a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt. St. Pierre didn't mess with the strikes early. What does that say about George St. Pierre's respect for Matt Sarah's stand up? Absolutely a ton. Heavy handed Matt Serra, as we found out the first time. St. Pierre is going to try to break him down and pose his will. Matt Serra is using a lockdown on that leg that's in his half guard, trapping that leg very tightly. Matt Serra's no slouch off of his back. He can do it all on the ground. Serra signaling to everyone around the world the two that he was ready to. Shocked the world for a second time here tonight. St. Pierre wants to prove that it wasn't a fluke, but it certainly was the upset that everybody considers it to be when he was defeated the first time by Matt Serra. Could this conservative approach be the full fight game plan? St. Pierre could be wanting to take him down early and then finish him up on the feet later. Who knows? This is an interesting, interesting start for George St. Pierre. So you're a bit surprised he went right for the takedown. I am. Uh, I at least uh, thought they'd feel it out on the feet. You know, uh, I thought George St. Pierre thought he would be the, the best uh, striker here uh, in this octagon, but apparently not. He took him right down. He's working the ground, pound, ground and pound, and even a conservative ground and pound. Indeed, and, and a little bit of the credit for that goes to Sarah and the great ground defense. Sarah trying to throw some elbows. He is an outstanding submission specialist. Elbows from the bottom again. 
Nice elbow by Matt Serra. Answered by George St. Pierre. He's working the inside. Matt Serra needs to keep his arms inside of George St. Pierre's oh, hands. Big ones there. Nice combination by George St. Pierre. Nice, nice combination. Postured up for a moment and boom, boom. The one noticeable difference in George St. Pierre, and there are many of them, but one that is really significant in this position is he's so much stronger than he was earlier in his career. George St. Pierre is. Half guard. That's a scary thought, you know, seeing what he was doing to the welterweight division before that, and now, you know, his team is saying that uh, he's even stronger. That's a scary thought. Back to a closed guard. Matt Serra takes an elbow. Just past the midway point of this first round, championship fight. So we are scheduled for five, five-minute rounds. St. Pierre starting to pick up the pace. He's getting a little busier, throwing some short elbows, short punches in the guard of Matt Serra. Matt Serra needs to keep those arms on the inside of St. Pierre's arms to block those, those punches, those elbows, and set up a sweep like he's trying to do there. Nice attempt by Matt Serra. St. Pierre in the half guard of Matt Serra now. St. Pierre is going to pass the guard of and Matt Serra. And he has Sarah. passed. This is bad for Matt Serra. Hammer fist from St. Pierre. George St. Pierre in a dominant position here in round one. St. Pierre has to be careful with the knee bar. OK, his leg is out. Matt Serra is going to get back to his guard. And he's back to his feet. St. Pierre, relentless in his attack here in the first four minutes St. of this title fight. GSP's doing a good job of riding Matt Serra here, using his weight. Matt Serra trying to escape. It's gonna, it's gonna spend a lot of energy. It's gonna spend a lot of energy. Got a mouse under the right eye, Serra. St. Pierre trying to overwhelm a very strong and powerful Matt Serra. He's chipping away. He's chipping away at Matt Serra. Very interesting strategy. Perhaps he wants to pick it up later on. Serra comes forward with a jab. Watch the overhand right of Serra. Serra looks a little slower on his feet now. Going to the body. Now in the stand-up game, Kenny, you've talked about it a lot. Nice Superman punch. Led with the left, followed with a kick. Very nice. He used this very effectively against Josh Koscheck. Oh, wow. This is exactly what I was talking about earlier when analyzing this fight. He needs to use a mixed bag of mixed martial arts. Takedowns, clinch, jujitsu, knees, and he's doing it. It's going to take away Sarah's rhythm. He's not going to be confident standing up. What a great first round turned in by George St. Pierre. Sarah looked a little frustrated going back to his corner. Nice shot by George St. Pierre coming down to the guard of Matt Serra. Nice one-two combination. What's surprising me the most, though, is the passing skills of George St. Pierre. He's been able to get through the half guard, get Make through sure the you guard. Get those elbows off when you're in guard, man. Let's listen into the corner here. Ray Longo. Defend the take. I don't know, he might try to stand up this round. St. Pierre, Phil Nurse, Greg Jackson. Ray Longo saying he may try to stand up this round. St. Pierre has confused the camp of Sarah. He's mixing it up with takedown, stand up. This is exactly what George St. Pierre should have done. It is worthy of mention, Sarah has only been knocked out once in his career. That was in 2001. The very famous spinning back fist by Shoney Carter late in the fight, a fight in which Sarah was dominating. And that was uh, Sarah's first fight in the UFC. Way back UFC 31, St. Pierre. Sarah, round two. Sarah again is forced to the mat. Nice leg kick by Matt Sarah. It was timed perfectly by George St. Pierre. Matt Sarah has an underhook with his left arm. Good position for him. He's going to look to kind of get back to his feet or sweep. He's using the fence to get back to his feet, possibly setting up a guillotine. You know, it's interesting, while St. Pierre is known so much for his great striking skills, 
He, he lands about 40% in his career of his strikes, but he is successful 80% of the time on his takedown attempts. He may be the best functional wrestler in mixed martial arts today. There's other guys coming in with better pedigrees than George St. Pierre on paper, but I don't think there's a better wrestler in MMA right now than George St. Pierre. And that's saying a lot. Talk about athleticism. We saw it displayed with Josh Koscheck, his opponent, Matt Hughes, even Sean Shirt, Frank Trigg. All about GSP so far here at home. Can he get Sarah down again? What balance by Matt Serra to avoid the takedown of George St. Pierre. Everyone talks about St. Pierre's athleticism. How about Matt Serra's? Yeah, Serra has a little bit of life. Wow, Matt Serra landing a head Matt kick. Serra. Spinning back kick. Serra kind of hanging those hands, but that's, that's kind of the way he approaches things. He wants to keep it in close. That's where Matt, this is where Matt Serra is dangerous. Inside with those short punches. Couple of good jabs by St. Pierre. Gotta get those hands up, Matt Serra. He's eating those jabs, Kenny. He's hanging that left hand. He's, he's not using head movement. He's dropping his hands. He's giving a lot of opportunities for George St. Pierre to work his jab and work his combinations. It almost seemed like he was just trying to wait for his spot to throw that big knockout punch, that, that overhand right that you alluded to earlier. I thought at first that's kind of how he hung his hands, but man, they were really down by his waist, especially the left hand before the takedown. This fight is going up and down, up and down. It's confusing Matt Serra and it's tiring him out. George St. Pierre is really grinding out these first couple rounds. I think he believes he has the better cardio and Matt Serra right now could be in trouble. Well, the condition of Serra has never been a question, but still, the conditioning against St. Pierre is, is a category generally that St. Pierre wins. St. Pierre's using the size and strength advantage right now. I mean, Matt Serra was once one of the top lightweights in the UFC, and he got his title shot at 170 because he fought maybe above his weight class to win the Ultimate Fighter for the comeback, and he made the most of that situation. 145 remains in the second round. Sarah is surviving, but can he start to score any points? Here he is once again, George St. Pierre on top, kind of chipping away, and really getting Matt Sarah to spend the energy. Very smart strategy on the part of George St. Pierre's camp. St. Pierre looks up at the clock. And George is playing this very smart too, Kenny. He's not overworking himself and gassing himself out trying to stop this fight because he knows, as of right now, he has complete control of it. That's exactly right. Great game planning, great execution by George St. Pierre. Very calculated and controlled. He passes to half guard. Let's see if he can get them out. He's going to pass right here. Side control, 50 seconds. Easy passing all night long for GSP. He's using a tight style of guard passing. He's cutting through Matt Serra's guard. Matt Serra has to come up with an answer for that pass and for those takedowns of George St. Pierre. Knees continuously into the midsection of Serra. Eve Levine right on top of the action. Serra turns, GSP doesn't stop. St. Pierre now has his back. 20 seconds remains. More knees by GSP. George St. Pierre is the undisputed UFC welterweight champion.
two tremendous champions. And in all likelihood, they will meet again. Sarah congratulating the UFC welterweight champion once again, George Rush St. Pierre. Classy display by Matt Sarah picking up George St. Pierre, you know, with all the bad blood being thrown at each other back and forth. These guys are true professionals. They obviously have a lot of respect for each other. You gotta get you gotta give your hat uh, to Matt Sarah. He hung in there. George St. Pierre just executed in what my opinion was a perfect game plan. George St. Pierre enjoys what truly is the greatest moment of his fighting career, winning here at home in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. And he is once again the king of the 170-pound division. Bruce Buffer with the official decision. Ladies and gentlemen, referee Eve Levine is called to stop to this contest at four minutes, 45 seconds of the second round. Declaring the winner, La Gagnon by TKO. And now, for the second time, the new UFC welterweight champion of the world, George Kenny Florian, George St. Pierre. George St. Pierre, what a win. I want to know about your strategy coming in here. Uh, you know, a lot of people thought you would strike with, with Matt Serra. You showed a very diverse mixed martial arts game out here. Even uh, getting the advantage on the ground against Matt Serra, which many people thought had the advantage. What was your strategy going into this fight? Well, before I, before I say something, I just want to say something to my fan here in French. Tout le monde, merci d'être venu. C'est le plus beau jour de ma vie. Et ce soir, venez célébrer avec moi la cage au sport. Tu sens belle, c'est ouvert jusqu'à 5 heures du matin. On n'est pas couché ce soir. My, my strategy was to make a physical fight. Make him tired as much as, he, as I can. Because I know I had the advantage the athleticism so I was trying to mix as much as I can up down up down ground and pound not play jiu-jitsu game but because jiu-jitsu that's his strength so that's how I won the fight I tire him out and then I took the fight well that was a perfect execution how does it feel to hit your redemption here against a very game Matt Serra here in your hometown of Montreal well first I want to say thanks to Matt Serra he came here he took the fight in my town, in Quebec, in Canada, in Montreal. Man, it means a lot to me. And if one day we have to fight again in New York, I will do the sacrifice, I promise. I'm a man of my word, I will go in your town to fight you if we have to do it. Both you guys showed some tremendous skills and more importantly, a lot of class. There was a lot of trash shot going back and forth or you know, emotions going on back and forth. And uh, congratulations. You are the welterweight champion of the UFC, and you did it here in Montreal! First, everybody, before, before something else, me and Matt Serra, we're buddy, we, we might have a drink tonight together, so please, not do nothing to, to this guy, he's a gentleman, he's just said stuff to hype up the fight, and I did as well, thank you very much. Congratulations. Pure class, both of these men. Truly deep down, there was never disrespect or disregard. Sarah has a lot of fun. Sarah is with Kenny. Matt. Matt, you uh, had some uh, tough odds here, having to fight this hero, hometown hero here. And uh, 
What'd you think about going into the fight? What was your strategy going into the fight? Did he surprise you with his strategy? Yeah, man, he felt real good on the bot on top, you know, and I was trying to get angles. I wanted to work a certain sweep I've been working. But uh, as the fight went on, he was slippery and he started landing some good shots, as you see. But I'm good people. I was always ugly to begin with, don't sweat it. <laughs> Matt, great job. Still, there's possibilities for another fight down the line. What's next for you? Man, I always fight whoever they put in front of me. And uh, next, I think I gotta take my wife on vacation. That's what I gotta do. But besides that, I I'll be back and I'll fight whoever they put in front of me, man. I wanna congratulate George. Uh, obviously, he's uh, phenomenal and he was the better man tonight. He's the best in the world. Matt Sarah, a lot of class, a lot of skills. I want to congratulate you on this fight and let's give this guy some applause. A well deserved. A well deserved ovation given to Matt the Terracera, who just as George St. Pierre has always done, just exhibited the class of the competitors in the world of mixed martial arts and in the UFC. It's a martial art based sport. It's not about street fighters, it's about talented athletes. And this is our Move of the Match brought to you by Edge Shape Gel. Get your edge. The continuous ability to ground and pound and the finish provides us with the move of the match brought to you by Edge Shape Gel as certainly tonight, George St. Pierre at his edge. And don't forget, you should get your edge. St. Pierre displayed in a lot of ways, Kenny, what this sport of mixed martial arts has turned into modern day. It is truly a beautiful culmination of a wide array of skills. You know, uh, George St. Pierre displayed mixed martial arts at its highest level tonight. Uh, you know, just confusing Matt Serra. Uh, I believe that was the right game plan uh, since the beginning. And uh, it's one thing to know the game plan, it's another to execute it. Uh, George St. Pierre did both beautifully. You gotta give credit uh, to the corner of George St. Pierre. Tremendous corner in Greg Jackson. And, uh, you know, that's a smart group of individuals over there. Uh, they formulated a great game plan, but in the end, it was George St. Pierre who was alone in the octagon, and he did his part in executing that game plan. St. Pierre, the first fight at home since 2005. He was stopped for the first time in his career, the first time they met Sarah. Tonight, he stopped Sarah for only the second time in Matt Sarah's mixed martial arts career. A night for the French Canadians to enjoy their hero, their golden son, their own. George Rush St. Pierre, once again, the undisputed UFC welterweight champion of the world. UFC 83, Sarah versus St. Pierre 2, has been brought to you by Edge Shape Gel. Get your edge. You know, we've said it before, Kenny, and, and you know, it, it's funny. Some people say, I, I always say, this is the most historic night in UFC history, but in a lot of ways, finally making it north of the border, this truly is one of the most historic nights in UFC history. In this crowd tonight, as good as any we have seen before. But St. Pierre, not the only French Canadian who was on the card tonight. A fight from earlier. Tonight, the Road Warriors travels lead him right home to Montreal as he looks to conquer and reign supreme by beating down Kuniyoshi Hiranaka. Kuniyoshi Hiranaka is a well-rounded veteran who has squared off against the best in the fight game over the last six years, including top welterweight contenders John Fitch and Tiago Alves. But after an up-and-down UFC career, Hiranaka makes no bones about his game plan against local favorite Jonathan Goulet. He's coming out to win impressively by any means necessary. Uh, Jonathan. I'm looking forward to fighting Goulet in his home country. After the fight, Canadian fans will be cheering for me. One of Canada's most exciting welterweights, Victoriaville, Quebec's Jonathan Goulet, injected a fresh dose of energy into his career late in 2007 with wins over Dan Chambers and Paul Georgette. Now fully focused and determined to make a run at the elite, Goulet 
wants to start 2008 in spectacular fashion. I can find any, any words to describe how I feel. The only word I see is a big wow. Wow, I'm going to be in the first UFC ever in Canada. And as soon as I have the chance, I'm going to knock him out. Coming up next, Kunayoshi Hiranaka takes on Jonathan, the road warrior Goulet. Some tremendous skills. Took a beat down, yes, in his last fight with Thiago Alves, but the one thing we saw in that fight is how much guts and determination Kuniyoshi Hiranaka has. Uh, Hiranaka has that Japanese samurai spirit. He showed in his la all three of his fights here in the UFC. And, uh, you know, he didn't have the striking level of Alves, but he showed how, how big a heart he, he has. Training with Yushin Okami and Keita Nakamura, the only losses in the UFC here in Naka has suffered, Kenny, Tiago Alves and John Fitch, and they're about 15 and two in the UFC combined. So as you talked about, he's faced some of the best of the best already in this welterweight division. Fitch and Alves are at the top of the welterweight division, in my opinion. And uh, I think that's gonna serve for a lot of great experience uh, for this fight here against Goulet. A Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Judo black belt. Kuniyoshi Hiranaka, 11 mixed martial arts wins in his career. And the young man fighting out of Tokyo, Japan, enters the octagon here in Montreal. His opponent tonight is a native son from right here in the province of Quebec. Born and raised in Victoriaville, Quebec, Canada, the road warrior who trains with George St. Pierre and David Luanzo and all of the most famous fighters here in Montreal makes this the first event in Canada official as he is officially the first man to step into the octagon alongside Kuniyoshi Hiranaka. Jonathan Goulet has been working a lot on his Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I believe this is where this fight's gonna end up. It's gonna end up on the ground. I think he knows that. He's been working a lot on his ground game. I think uh, Goulet has the advantage here in the striking. He's been working on his wrestling as well. Uh, obviously, he's tra having training partners in Patrick Cote and George St. Pierre. Uh, he's gonna be prepared for this fight. Is there any, any, I, I guess, worry, if you will, for Jonathan Goulet of being overly excited, overly aggressive, because he's here at home in Montreal? Uh, you know, we've seen in the past where when they're fighting in their hometown, uh, it can, you know, give them motivation or it can uh, give them nerves and, and make them nervous. They're fighting in front of their family, their hometown. Uh, it, it could add, uh, you know, to, to a poor performance. Uh, to me, just seeing Goulet walk out, he looks calm, he looks collected, and uh, he seems comfortable. And Jonathan, the road warrior Goulet, enters the octagon for the seventh time in his mixed martial arts career. And a great ovation for the French Canadian. Goulet, a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu blue belt. Our tale of the tape for this welterweight matchup is brought to you by the only motorcycles worthy of being in the octagon, Harley Davidson. Kuniyoshi Hiranaka, the Japanese fighter, three years the elder of the French Canadian. Uh, Jonathan Goulet will have a slight reach advantage. And now, with the official introductions of this fight, the veteran voice of the octagon, Bruce Buffer. Madame et Monsieur, bonsoir! This fight is three rounds in the UFC welterweight division. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner. This man is a judo and a shooto fighter. He holds 11 wins with four losses. Standing five feet, 10 inches tall, weighing in at 170 pounds. Fighting out of Tokyo, Japan, Kuniyoshi! And now introducing his opponent, fighting out of the red corner. This man is a kickboxer and Brazilian jiu-jitsu fighter, holding a professional record of 29 wins with nine losses and one no contest. 
He stands six feet one inch tall, weighing in at 169 and one half pounds. Riding out of Victoriaville, Quebec, Canada, Jonathan the Road Warrior Goulet. And when the action begins, our referee in charge of the octagon is Dan Mergliata. Dan Mergliata, our referee. A welterweight matchup here inside the Bell Center. Kuna Yoshi Hiranaka. You ready? Against you ready? Jonathan Goulet. And here we go. Goulet in the white trunks, Hiranaka in the black trunks. Goulet wants to keep this on the feet, I believe. I think he thinks he's the, the better technical striker. Hiranaka's gonna try to take to the ground. That's definitely where he has the strength. And he started off early. Kick by Jonathan Goulet. Oh, and he goes for the head kick. The chance of Goulet already here early in round number one. Hiranaka's measuring. He's trying to find that distance where he can shoot in. I think he wants to keep Goulet up against the fence. Goulet's backing him up right now. I don't think that's where he's comfortable. He just shot in right there. Well, Goulet has certainly been working on his wrestling skills as well. Good knees. And a big knee delivered there. Just missed with the elbow, Kenny. Excellent tie clinch by Goulet. He's circling off the fence very nicely, getting a nice plump position on Hiranaka. Of course, you hear a lot of talk about George St. Pierre training with the wrestlers of the Canadian Olympic team. Well, that means that obviously Goulet has been afforded the same opportunities. He showed some great wrestling right there. He just uh, his back was up against the fence. He just reversed Hiranaka, and here he is once again where he wants to be. They break him up. And Goulet, good combination. Got him with the right. Goulet looks very relaxed out there. Beautiful striking by Goulet. Teeing off here in Naka. Seems to be okay though, now he'll come back. Goulet seems really relaxed. Uh, definitely has cleaned up his striking. Great knees, he's always had great knees, but his hand combinations was really impressive. Wow, not even close on that takedown attempt, and Goulet almost really made him pay. Hiranaka seems a little nervous. He's shooting out from a little too far away. He has to set up his takedowns a little bit better with his strikes. Would you like to see Goulet try to keep the distance? Absolutely. Uh, he, he needs to use that jab. Uh, he's coming forward very aggressively now. I, I don't think he respects the takedowns of Hiranaka, and, and that could uh, pose a lot of problems for Hiranaka. They exchange blows. Yeah, Goulet looks like he's starting to push forward, almost uh, feeling, feeling like he can be Almost indestructible as he walks in on Hiranaka. Hiranaka's bleeding already. Uh, Goulet's taking a couple shots on the way in. I'd like to see more head movement from him as he comes forward. Uh, make sure that he's not getting hit with shots as he comes forward. Midway point of round number one. Fight scheduled for three five minute rounds. A little Superman punch. The front kick and an inside leg kick by Goulet. So mixing things up here. Nice leg kick by Goulet. That landed solid. Hiranaka tried to counter. Goulet looks very comfortable. Hiranaka with that long left hand, though. Threw a jab into the face of Goulet. He might get this one. No! Goulet able to throw a big knee! Beautiful counter by Goulet. Excellent Uchimata counter. Hiranaka's having a lot of trouble trying to take him down. Goulet is not respecting his, those takedowns at all. Let's see if Jonathan Goulet tries to set something up here, Kenny. There's the Superman punch again. Hiranaka appears to be really uncomfortable in this situation. Although he just shakes it off like it's not bothering him. I really like what Goulet's doing. He's throwing a mixed bag of, of knees, kicks, punches, elbows. He's, he's keeping a very diverse striking game, and it's really confusing Hiranaka at this point. Coming off that brutal beatdown, if you will, against Tiago Alves, but Alves just knocked out Carl Parisian. So we know this man is tough, the double black belt, Kuniyoshi Hiranaka, but he's not been able to maybe get the fight to the ground if he wants to. Of course, he likes to stand, but right now he's not getting the best of the stand-up game. And what's worse, he looks tired already. He's dropping oh, his hands, he, he just dropped Goulet. Goulet. Caught him with the left. Goulet is hurt, Goulet just flopped down to his back. Hiranaka smells Hiranaka blood right now. trying to finish the fight. Goulet looking to recover. He caught him with a big left. And now goes to side control. Back to half guard. 
This is how fight, this is how quickly a fight can change. Goulet needs to get back to his feet. He's still hurt. 35 seconds remains. Haranaka just walked through his half guard into mount position. He's trying to get mount position again. He's in half guard. He's trying to go for the arm lock there. 23 seconds now, Kenny. Goulet has uh, composed himself to a certain degree here, although he's taking a lot of punishment. Goulet is still hurt. He's trying to get back to his feet, which he needs to do. He's gonna doing a good job of avoiding the mount position. He's getting that underhook, which is frustrating. Hiranaka, Hiranaka's landing some big shots. Goulet's got to defend himself, and he'll make it to the second round. Will Goulet make it? Will he make it? Whoa! Yes, just barely. Let's look at that. That's the shot. It was a left hand that dropped Goulet. He was coming in where you're most susceptible. Here it is again. Bang. Right on the chin of Goulet. That dropped him. He got overly aggressive. Made him susceptible to that uh, left hand on the way in. Is he good? Kenny, we said that Hiranaka was tough. And he does like to stand. He had not gotten the better of the stand-up game until that point. And now there is going to be a big sense of doubt in between the ears of Jonathan Goulet as we get set for round number two. That's a big old mouse under the right eye of Jonathan Goulet. This is how quickly a fight can change in the UFC. I mean, he was dominating the action. Boom, Hiranaka definitely wasn't as comfortable as Goulet on the feet. Caught him with that one punch, and it changed the whole pace of the fight. And he was just able to survive as Dan Mergliata was right there, ready to stop that whoa, whoa, fight. Whoa, whoa, Saved by the bell indeed, Jonathan Goulet. Goulet has a big mouse uh, on the right you side ready? of the fight. Well. All right, let's see how Goulet approaches things here now after getting rocked. Goulet again in the white trunks, Siranaka in the black trunks. Goulet has to keep his hands up as he throws his punches. That's where he got caught last time. He's got to do a good job of keeping that right hand up as he throws that left hand jab. Yeah, let's keep an eye on that, Kenny, because he definitely dropped it and got rocked. Especially with the mouse on that right side. He's got to keep that right hand. He's starting to drop it a little bit now. Nice kick by Goulet. Goulet tries to come forward with a big elbow. Nice flying elbow by Goulet. Hiranaka flips that left hand out very quickly. That's how he caught Goulet in round number one. Hiranaka seems a lot more confident now. He really changed it up at the end of that round. May have stolen that round. Hiranaka hangs those hands low, though. Goulet. He just dropped him again. again. It's, that, it's that left hand, that left hand hook that's catching Goulet again and again. How would you, if you were out there, approach that fact that knowing the left hand continues to beat you down, what would you do differently? He has to keep that right hand up. That's where he's getting caught. He's getting a little lazy with that right hand. He's got to keep that tight to his temple. Hiranaka almost seems like at this point trying to toy with Goulet. Bring him in and see if he can hit him hard again. This is a new fighter right now in Hiranaka. He has a lot of confidence right now. Him dropping it, him dropping Goulet in the end of that first round really changed him. His confidence is flying high now. Goulet is now backing Hiranaka up. This is what he needs to do. There Superman it is. punch has worked almost every time. But Hiranaka shakes it off to the crowd again. No big deal. He's tough as nails. We saw him in his last fight against John Fitch, against Alves. Very, very durable fighter with a great chin. Oh, a huge elbow! Hiranaka goes down! Goulet with a big knee! Goulet pushing forward! Hiranaka walks away! Goulet continues! And another knee! Goulet's trying to finish him off. He's getting the plump position, trying to grab the head. He got him again! It's down, and it is over! It is all over! Unbelievable! Jonathan Goulet wins here in Montreal! Unbelievable knockout by Goulet. It all started with that lethal elbow. Here it is, a right hand right to the jaw of Hiranaka. Gets on top, throwing knees once again. A right hand again, right in the same spot of that chin. That's what finished the job right there. Unbelievable job by Goulet, what a war. He mixed things up as you said, Kenny. Through the super band punch, through an elbow, 
through a couple other elbows, and definitely in the end ends up rocking Kuniyoshi Hiranaka. Wow, what a difference a millisecond makes for the life of Jonathan Goulet. Now, it's got to feel unbelievable. This is his hometown. Just one in very dominant fashion over a very tough Hiranaka. Jonathan Goulet is the victor. Bruce Buffer has the official decision. Ladies and gentlemen, referee Dan Mergliata has called a stop to this contest at two minutes, seven seconds of the second round. Declaring Le Gagnon and winner by TKO, Jonathan, the Road Warrior Goulet. What a special night indeed it turns out to be for the Road Warrior, Jonathan Goulet, who wins two minutes and seven seconds into the second round of action after he had been in trouble at the end of the first. Kenny Florian in the octagon with Jonathan Goulet. John, unbelievable knockout. How does that feel in your hometown of Montreal? Unbelievable job. How'd that feel? It's always, it's always crazy to be here, you know? Whoever I'm going to fight here in my hometown, that's going to be the same, the same damn bullshit, you know? I'm going to knock my opponent out like this. <laughs> You got hurt in that first round. How did you feel? You recovered great and came back to knock out your opponent. You showed a lot of heart out there. How were you feeling when you got knocked out at the end of the first round? Uh, you know, I, I, was, uh, I was scared a little bit, but you know, I came back uh, faster because uh, uh, I'm really in good shape because of my trainer, uh, Jonathan Chamber. Uh, we train a lot on my cardio. So, so it's for that. You know, I, I, uh, I came back very fast. And after that, you know, it's because of all of you, you know, I was able to hear you right here in the middle of the ring, and you gave me that power, that power to knock him out. Give it up for John Goulet! Congratulations, John! Thank you. Jonathan, the Road Warrior Goulet, wins in impressive fashion here tonight at the Bell Center in Montreal. So the French Canadians on this historic night go 2 and 0. Oh. Take a look at our submission of the night, brought to you by Tap Out. American, arrogant, and in your face, Damian Maya, one of your favorite Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu guys, Kenny. Uh, he showed why he's the best in the world in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, finishing that triangle from the mount, spectacular win. A spectacular night indeed for Damian Maya. He finishes Ed Herman, and he is awarded our submission of the night. Brought to you by Tap Out. Watch Tap Out on their crazy second season starting this June. It was all about George St. Pierre, Matt Sarah tonight, and in the end, the main story, the big story, is George St. Pierre. You know, uh, George St. Pierre showed what mixed martial arts is all about. Uh, really came at him with just a very diverse game, and then Matt Sarah just couldn't get a rhythm. He couldn't adapt. And uh, you, you got to give credit to uh, the camp of George St. Pierre on game planning. St. Pierre just did a tremendous job. And uh, talk about achieving your dreams. Winning the title in your hometown must be an unbelievable feeling for GSP. Especially overcoming the adversity, which was, Kenny, his loss about a year ago to Matt Sarah. Great job tonight. <laughs> Joe was watching. He was watching. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, buddy. <laughs> family obligations for Joe Rogan. Kenny Florian will be back in the octagon soon. And it was indeed a magical evening here tonight. Sold out as it was, Kenny, at the Bell Center right here in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. And here's what's coming up inside the octagon. Every Wednesday this spring, it's the ultimate fighter, Team Rampage versus Team Forest. Then on Saturday, May 24th, from the MGM Grand Garden Arena in Las Vegas, Nevada, it's UFC 84, Ill Will. BJ, the prodigy pen, takes on Sean, the muscle shark shirt. Also that night, Tito Ortiz faces Leoto, the dragon Machida, and the axe murderer, Vanderlei Silva, returns to the octagon to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Keith Jardine. UFC 84, live Saturday, May 24th, only on pay-per-view. The UFC returns to the UK on Saturday, June 7th from the O2 Arena in London, England. UFC 85, live on pay-per-view. Tickets are still available. Then it's back to Las Vegas in the Mandalay Bay Event Center for UFC 86 as Quentin Rampage Jackson faces Forrest Griffin. Saturday, July 5th, tickets are still available. And that's what's coming up inside the Octagon.
And don't forget, log on to UFC.com to watch all the unaired preliminary fights tonight, including a great all-Canadian battle between Jason McDonald and Joe Dirksen, contested here tonight in both their home countries of Canada. It was as loud a crowd as we have ever experienced inside the octagon, and they were all here to cheer for their native son. And in the end, George Rush St. Pierre did not disappoint. A magical night indeed, and this will not be the last time the octagon comes to Canada. The executive producers of the Ultimate Fighting Championship, Frank Fertitta III, Lorenzo Fertitta, and UFC President Dana White. Our show is always run by our supervising producer, Craig Borsari, produced by Bruce Connell, and directed by Anthony Pasquale Giordano. Our director of production, Tim O'Toole. Technical producer, Alan Connell. And the best in the business, our matchmaker, Joe Silva. Michael the Count Bisbing says, don't count me out of a title possibility at 185. And how about Nate Quarry? Totally overwhelming. The British Columbia native, Caleb Starnes, looking as good as he ever has. Crowd was crazy. Griffin had a Canadian's jersey. And Rich Franklin, my friends, is back. Saved his arm and saved the best for last. Finishing the fight tonight. And then in our main event of the evening, Matt Sarah, George St. Pierre. Sarah was surprised by St. Pierre's tactics. St. Pierre was as good as we have ever seen before. We bid you au revoir and bonsoir from beautiful Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Until next time, we see you right back here inside the Octagon as it is a night to celebrate. Once again, the welterweight champion is George Rush St. Pierre. So long, everybody. Velasquez, 25 years old, four years younger than the Aussie. Velasquez weighed in 10 pounds heavier. He will have a three-inch reach advantage in this heavyweight matchup. With the official introductions, here's Bruce Buffer. Ladies and gentlemen, this fight is three rounds in the UFC heavyweight division. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner. This man is a mixed martial artist, holding a professional record of 10 wins with two losses. Standing six feet, one inch tall, weighing in at 225 and one half pounds. Fighting out of Sydney, Australia, Brad Morris. And now introducing his opponent, fighting out of the red corner. This man is a wrestler and a kickboxer, holding a professional record of two wins with no losses. Standing six feet, one inch tall, weighing in at 235 and one half pounds. Fighting out of San Jose, California, Kain Velasquez. And when the action begins, our referee in charge of the octagon is Steve Mazzagatti. Steve Mazzagatti, our referee, the beautiful Ariani, Edith. The octagon gates open for the first time here north of the border. Set for a huge heavyweight matchup. As I said, Kyan Velasquez, highly touted. He wants to show right, that he can go. be a factor quickly. On. He is ready to go. I'm interested to see how relaxed these guys are here in their debut. UFC Jitters has gotten uh, many a fighter here. And uh, Kaim looks very, very relaxed. Morris looks a little nervous out there. Morris with an early takedown attempt. It wasn't even close. Down he goes. Is he out yet? No. Morris is up, but thrown back down. Kyan Velasquez trying to finish the fight early. Morris is hurt. He caught him again. Morris was coming in, caught him right on the chin, right on the button. He's working mount position. He's working patiently from that half guard. Looks very relaxed. Beating him up with punches here. And he's got the full mount. He's in the full mount. He needs a keep position here. Keep Morris on his back and finish him off. This is really bad for Brad Morris. Velasquez knocked him down. Now he's got the mount. Now he's teeing off. Those are some heavy shots. Got his back. Kain looks very relaxed in there. He's just beating him up, waiting for the opening for the choke, keeping great position. He gave up. Morris pay again and again, yeah. He gave up that back mount. 
See, as a wrestler, he looks more, more controlled, more comfortable just kind of riding his opponent. He doesn't want to lose position. He kind of wants just to stay on top, beat him up. That oh, rocks. That time. rocked Morris right there. Morris is in trouble. Mazzagani right on top of the action. Morris just trying to avoid any way he can, and he's not doing so yet. Morris is a tough guy. He's taking a lot of shots in there. Cain is very happy just pounding on him. He's not really looking for a submission here. That would be the one area of his game that we can tell already is uh, is still in need of evolving. That's correct. cain has got to be careful that Morris doesn't roll into a knee bar there. Morris is trying to roll out, trying to wrap that leg. Cain is unloading, unloading on Morris. Oh, and another good leg strike. Caught him again with a combination. Morris down again. Velasquez waiting patiently for Steve Mazzagani to stop this fight. Well, Morris is taking a lot of shots. This fight should be and stopped. And it right is by. all over. Kayan Velasquez victorious in his UFC debut. Absolute domination by the two-time All-American. Caught him early, knocked him down, and then it was uh, truly a methodical finish. This is where it all started to go bad for Morris. This is where it ended bad for Morris. There was a big uppercut right to the chin that dropped Morris for a second or third time. Here he is, finishing him off with strikes on the ground. Morris was really in deep trouble. That first knockdown, he was never the same. This is where he first dropped him. Caught him right on the end, right on the way in with the left hand, right on the button. Hammer strikes. There he is, boom, left hand right to the outside of the jaw. Morris was never the same after that shot. And relentless in his attack. Wanted to finish with the ground and pound, finish impressively. And not the debut that the Australian Brad Morris hoped to make here inside the octagon. One down, who knows what will come for the heavyweight newcomer out of the American Kickboxing Academy. With the official decision, here's Bruce Buffer. Ladies and gentlemen, referee Steve Mazzagatti has called a stop to this contest at two minutes, ten seconds of the very first round. Declaring Legano and winner by TKO, Cain Velasquez. Two minutes, ten seconds of domination. Velasquez in the octagon with our own Kenny Florian. Kain, you know, everybody came in here thinking you were a wrestler. You came out and surprised everyone with your strikes. How'd you feel out here in your debut? Felt good. Uh, I trained about a year for this. Stand up, everything. I think I'm ready. Uh, one step at a time, but uh, I felt good. Felt really good to come out and give the, give the fans a show. Great job in there. You rocked him a couple times. How'd you feel after you knocked him down that first time? Did you try to finish it? Seems like you stayed calm, stayed collected kind of avoided the submission game, trying to want to ride him and then finish him off later on. That's exactly how I felt. Uh, I felt him go down. I didn't think he was completely out, so just basically uh, stay, stay in a good position, you know, and uh, turn the ground around. Very impressive debut, Cain. Congratulations. Thank you. Great job. Herman, the American, 27 years old, three years younger than Maya, two inches taller, and Herman will have a three-inch reach advantage. Once again with our official introductions, the veteran voice of the Octagon, Bruce Buffer. Ladies and gentlemen, this fight is three rounds in the UFC middleweight division. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner, a Brazilian jiu-jitsu fighter holding a perfect professional record of seven wins with no losses. Standing six feet tall, weighing in at 184 and one half pounds. Fighting out of Sao Paulo, Brazil, Debian Maia! And now introducing his opponent, fighting out of the red corner. 
a freestyle fighter holding a professional record of 16 wins with four losses. Standing six feet two inches tall, weighing in at 185 and one half pounds. Two Fighting out of Portland, Portland Oregon, Oregon, Ed Short Cruz Herman. And when the action begins, our referee in charge of the octagon is Philip Chartier. So, Philip Chartier. Here at the Bell Center, our referee for this middleweight showcase. Ed Herman. Ready? Against Ready. Damian Maya. Hurry. And here we go. White trunks for Maya. Orange and black trunks for Herman. Maya comes out quickly with a head kick and quickly also went for the takedown of pull guard. Herman was nearly submitted, remember, although he knocked out Dirksen in the end, Kenny. He was nearly submitted in that fight by Joe Dirksen. And Maya is not the kind of guy you want to go to the ground with. Uh, he's certainly a guy who can do it again. Um, he, Maya's doing a great job. He just went from his back, switching to a single leg. He's got Herman up against the fence. It's going to make it difficult for Herman to sprawl. Herman's doing a good job of making him pay for that single leg, though. Damian Maya, three-time World Cup champ. 2006 Pan Am champ. Seven-time state champ back in Brazil. Gets his takedown. If there's a position that Ed Herman doesn't want to be in, this is it right here. On his back with Damian Maya on top. What separates Damian Maya's jiu-jitsu in this position from the many other fine jiu-jitsu practitioners we have in the mixed martial arts world in the UFC today? It's his sensitivity, it's his uh, knowledge of basics, um, his leverage. He's just so knowledgeable, so technical out there. And uh, he's very efficient. He's not wasting energy un uh, unnecessarily. Herman tried to work his way back up. He's up again, but he can't release from the clinch of Damian Maya. Jiu-Jitsu is uh, called the gentle art. And... Uh, Damian Maia is very much in line with that philosophy. He does not want to hurt his opponent if he doesn't have to. His line when asked what his favorite technique is, submit my opponent without him hurting me or me hurting him. Not exactly the uh, pre-fight fodder we are accustomed to hearing. <laughs> he's, he's a class act, Damian Maia, a true professional. And he's bringing it to the ground once again here against uh, Ed Herman. He couldn't take him down. He's content to go right to his back and work a sweep or a submission. He has to be careful with Ed Herman's elbows from the top position. Ed Herman has some nasty elbows. Here he's setting up a beautiful omoplata. Can he finish? Excellent setup, switching into a knee bar, possibly a triangle choke from here. Ed Herman has to be careful. Herman safe for now. You can see those flashes of brilliance in Damian Maia's jiu-jitsu game. Very fluid, very technical. He just has to be careful in half guard. Flawless transitions demonstrated so far here by Damian Maya. He's trying to work a half guard sweep. This could be a bad position for him. He understands that, goes back to a full guard. Nice job by Damian Maya. He's got to watch those short elbows, though. From Herman's perspective, in the top position, knowing how talented and how dangerous Maya is on his back, does, does that make and Ed Herman hesitant to do too much in the ground and pound so he doesn't get caught. I think so. Ed Herman's usually a lot busier. Uh, and Maya's doing a great job of keeping him off his rhythm. Right here, he's transitioning to a beautiful heel hook. He's got his other leg, his far leg trapped, so he can't roll. Herman's in trouble here, and he's on top. Look at the fluid game of Maya. He's already working a pass. Sweep, almost in the mount position. He's going to mount right here. He's working that mount. He's pushing down on the knee. Look at that pressure. With the shoulder up on the face of Ed Herman. He's going to work the Kimura. Can he use that leg lock to get right into the position to sweep? I see some blood on Maya. He could be cut. Full here. mount. He's right in the mount. Gorgeous, gorgeous jiu-jitsu from Damian Maya. 110 remains in the first round. Fight scheduled for three five-minute rounds. All Maya thus far. Good elbow. And another one. Damian Maia is not being too gentle here from the mouth. Throwing elbows. He needs to open him up. Herman's not going to submit right from here in the mouth position. He has to get him to move with those strikes. That's the key to opening up that submission. Philip Chartier has a close look at the man on his back, Ed Herman. It's going to be very difficult for someone to get Maya off this mouth position. He's high on the chest. 
Pressing down. Herman is in deep trouble here. Herman spins though and he's out. Wow, beautiful, beautiful escape by Herman. He just rolled off. And now Herman trying to punish. Maya got a little too aggressive from the mouth there. Lost his position. Has an underhook. Maya's mixing it up. He's got an underhook position. And pulls guard again. Almost ate an elbow. Good job defending himself. Five seconds remains in the round. Herman's being busier now on the ground and pound. Right. Nonetheless, a bit of a clinic put on by Damian Maya. Let's see that set up by Damian Maya. Beautiful omoplata. Then went to transition to the knee bar. Here it is again. He got has the heel hook, has the far leg trapped. Herman has no choice but to go to his back and roll out. Damian Maya transitions beautifully, gets on top. Didn't get the heel hook, but, but got the reversal. Beautiful jiu-jitsu. Ed Herman has gone the distance just two times in his mixed martial arts career. One of them was in the Ultimate Fighter 3 finale when he lost the unanimous decision to Kendall the Spider Grove. This has been a very fast-paced fight, Goldie. I think it's going to come down to conditioning. Both fighters uh, seem pretty, pretty cool going into the second round. Could come down to this third round here as we come up to the second round. Let's see how uh, efficient Maya is with his jujitsu and getting, trying to get that takedown, and how much energy Herman expends trying to avoid the ground game and trying to get that uh, respect that he so dearly believes he is not getting present day in this fight world. They touch gloves. It's a great first round. They have to give it to Maya. Constantly working for submission. Got the better positioning. Maya, take the strike. And pulls guard. It's rare that you see someone as comfortable as Maya. Just very content to shoot in, bring it down. He's comfortable going right to his back and working his jiu-jitsu game. You talked about the control he has. Taken down by Herman. But again, if you're Damian Maya, you don't mind this position too much. Absolutely. He oh, has to that's be careful. a good those, strike, though. Those are the short punches that Herman needs to do. He can't overextend himself and open himself up to an arm lock or a triangle. You have to be short punches and short elbows. This is where he can hurt Maya, especially from that half guard position. Herman finally able to posture up for a moment, and it paid good dividends. Body, head, elbow. Maya is using his feet on the hips. I think he's transitioned now. Almost a full guard. Maya's getting a little lazy with his guard. There. He stay, needs to stay more active. Yeah, Herman doing a better job too, staying out of the guard, getting up, posturing up, and once scoring again, some points. Once again, going to that butterfly guard transition into a heel hook. Beautiful sweep. Almost a sweep. Nice flying knee by Herman. You talked about conditioning a moment ago. It visibly appears that Maya is getting worn down. He's starting to kind of flop to his back. He's not as active. He doesn't seem as from his guard with the submissions, with the sweeps. He's kind of trying to regroup here, get his win back, and set up another one of those crazy sweeps he's got in his repertoire. Kenny, in the first round, Herman was never able to posture up. And now there's no control for Maya, at least very, very little control of Herman posturing up and then coming back down with strikes. A couple things going on. Oh, beautiful. Tri oh! Almost a triangle by Maya. Very smooth transition. Herman's starting to find his rhythm a little bit here. Up, step, he's caught another triangle. This may be the end. This fight. I think this is the end, Goldie. It's tight. It's and wrapped Herman up very gets tight. Out of this. Wow. He spins. Right Maya in the still mouth. has it. Herman's in trouble. He's going to have the tappers out. Maya pounding away. He is out. He is it out. Is all over. Damian Maya wins. Maya is a genius on the ground. There's nothing, no else way to describe it. That was unbelievable. He spun, he got his submission, and once he got that great position, Kenny, you could see it was over pretty quickly. Here it is. It was a beautiful setup. He had his right foot on the hip, kind of coaxed him into passing the guard, flopped right into that triangle. Herman tried to roll out of it. Unfortunately, he rolled himself into the mount. Brutal choke. He, had, he was actually out. Maya kept throwing punches, but he went out. He was knocked out from right the there. choke. Yep. 
It was the choke that knocked Herman out. It was not the punches. It seals off the carotid artery. And Herman went to sleep. Well, Herman showing great courage. Not tapping, but Damian Maya able to send him to defeat. Here inside the sold-out Bell Center in Montreal. Damian Maya, 2-0 now in the UFC, 8-0 in his mixed martial arts career. It looked as if Maya was running a little bit out of gas, but he just waited for that opportunity. And we've talked about it before. Submissions can be as sudden as a big right hand or a head kick in finishing a fight. And all it took was a little bit of an opening, and Damian Maya was able to complete the victory here this evening. Bruce Buffer has our official decision. Ladies and gentlemen, referee Philip Chartier has called a stop to this contest at 2 minutes 27 seconds of the second round. Declaring Le Gagnon and winner by submission, Damian Maya! Not a surprise with the victory that it comes by submission for Damian Maya. Maya he is in the octagon with Kenny Florian. Damian, congratulations. Uh, you showed why. You're the best jiu-jitsu guy to ever step into the octagon. Unbelievable job. You controlled that first round. Got a little tight in that second round. How'd you feel going into that second round, Damian? He's very, very tough guy, you know, sh sh tall and tough, so it's very hard to fight against him, but my jiu-jitsu always helped me, always saved me in the worst times. Unbelievable job from your back. Uh, you had a little bit of trouble with the takedowns uh, by the end of the first round, the end of the second round. How comfortable are you on your back in here against a great ground pound, especially against uh, like Ed Herman? Yeah, because he has, you know, very good take down the fence, as and he's not, he's smart when he was from the bottom. So, tough fight, you know, complete fight. Damien, congratulations. Beautiful Jiu Jitsu game, beautiful MMA. Congratulations. And I just say thank you to Montreal. Uh, I want to say in Brazil, we don't have a hockey team. So, I don't have a hockey team, but now I have here in Montreal.